Hello. If someone could please double check. The oh my god, that drawing is beautiful. Sorry. Um, let's just, if someone could please double check the volume and make sure everyone can hear me okay, before we get this started. It seems fine. Okay, cool. So, today, we're back with the Thunderdome crew. We actually managed to get this play done. I promised it when we did Hamlet, and we actually managed to do it even though it took us an hour. So today, we're going to be doing Richard II. We're going to be continuing the Henriad in the wrong direction. And it's surprisingly an expansive cast, and we've got a lot of roles to play, but we're going to have a good time, because we always have a good time. So, without further ado... Act 1, Scene 1. London, King Richard II's Palace. Enter King Richard II, John of Gaunt, with other nobles and attendants. Old John of Gaunt, time honored Lancaster, hast thou, according to thy oath and band, brought hither Henry Herford, thy bold son, here to make good the boisterous late appeal which then our leisure would not let us hear against the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray? I have, my liege. Tell me, moreover, hast thou sounded him if he appealed the duke on ancient malice, or worth, worthly as a good subject should, on some known ground of treachery in him? As near as I could sift him on that argument, on some apparent danger seen in him, aimed at your highness, no inveterate malice. Then call them to our presence, face to face and frowning bow to bow. Ourselves will hear the accuser and the accused speak freely. High stomach are they both, and full of ire, in rage death as the sea, hasty as fire. Enter Henry Bolingbroke and Thomas Mowbray. Many years of happy days before my most gracious sovereign, my most loving liege. Each day still better others' happiness, until the heavens, envying earth's good hap, add an immortal title to your crown. We thank you both. Yet one but flatters us, as well apparent by the course you come, namely to appeal each other of high treason. Cousin of Hereford, what dost thou object against the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray? First, heaven be the record to my speech, in the devotion of a subject's love, tendering the precious safety of my prince, and free from other misbegotten hate, come I appellant to this princely presence. Now, Thomas Mowbray, do I turn to thee and mark my greeting well, for what I speak, my body shall make good upon this earth, or my divine soul answer it in heaven. Thou art a traitor and a miscreant, too good to be so and too bad to live, since the more fair and crystal is the sky, the uglier seem the clouds that in it fly. One more, the more to aggravate the note, with a foul traitor's name, stuff I thy throat, and wish, so please my sovereign, ere I move, what my tongue speaks, my right-drawn sword may prove. Let not my cold words here accuse my zeal. Tis not the trial of a woman's war. The bitter clamour of two eager tongues can arbitrate this cause betwixt us twain. The blood is hot that must be cooled for this. Yet can I not of such tame patience boast to be hushed and naught at all to say? First, the fair reverence of your highness curbs me from giving reins and spurs to my free speech, which else would post until it had returned these terms of treason doubled down his throat, setting aside his high blood's royalty, and let him be no kinsman to my liege. I do defy him, and I spit at him, call him a slanderous coward and a villain, which to maintain I would allow him odds, and meet him were I tied to run afoot even to the frozen ridges of the Alps, or on any other ground inhabitable, wherever Englishman doth set his foot. Meantime, let this defend my loyalty, by all my hopes most falsely doth he lie. Hail, trembling coward! There, I throw my gauge. Disclaiming here the kindred of the king, and lay aside my high blood's royalty, which fear, not reverence, makes thee too exempt. If the guilty dread have left thee so much strength as to take up mine honour's pawn, then stoop. By that, and all rights of knighthood else, 
will I make good against thee, arm to arm, what I have spoke, or thou canst worse devise. I take it up, and by that sword I swear, which gently laid my knighthood on my shoulder, I'll answer thee in any fair decree, or chivalrous design of knightly trial. And when I mount, alive may I not light, if I be traitor or unjustly fight. What doth our cousin lay to Mowbray's charge? It must be great that can inherit us as much as a thought of ill in him. Look, what I speak, my life shall prove it true, that Mowbray hath received eight thousand nobles in name of lendings for your highness's soldiers, the which he hath detained for lewd employments, like a false traitor and injurious villain. Besides, I say, and will in battle prove, or here or elsewhere, to the furthest verge that ever was surveyed by English eye, that all the treasons for these eighteen years complotted and contrived in this land fetch from false Mowbray their first head and spring. Further, I say, and further will maintain, upon his bad life to make all this good, that he did plot the Duke of Gloucester's death suggest his soon believing adversaries and consequently like a traitor coward sluiced out his innocent soul through streams of blood which blood like sacrificing abels cries even from the tongueless caverns of the earth to me for justice and rough chastisement and by the glorious worth of my descent this arm shall do it, or this life be spent. <laughs> How high a pitch is resolution soars! Thomas of Mowbray, what sayest thou to this? Oh, let my sovereign turn away his face and bid his ears a little while be deaf, till I have told this slander of his blood how God and good men hate so foul a liar. Mowbray, impartial are our eyes and ears. Were he my brother, nay, my kingdom's heir, as he is by my father's brother's son, now by my sceptre's all I make a vow. Such neighbour nearness to our sacred blood should nothing privilege him, nor partialize the unstooping firmness of my upright soul. He is our subject, Mowbray, so art thou. Free speech and fearless I to thee allow. Then, Bolingbroke, as low to thy heart, through the false passage of thy throat, thou liest. Three parts of that receipt I had for Calais, dispersed I duly for my highness's soldiers, on the other part reserved I by consent, for that my sovereign liege was in my debt upon the remainder of a dear account, since last I went to France to fetch his queen. Now swallow down that lie. For Gloucester's death I slew him not, but to my own disgrace neglected my sworn duty in that case. For you, my noble lord of Lancaster, the honourable father to my foe, once did I lay an ambush for your life, a trespass that doth vex my grieved soul. But ere I last received the sacrament, I did confess it and exactly begged your grace's pardon, and I hope I had it. This is my fault. As for the rest appealed, it issues from the rancour of a villain, a recreant and most degenerate traitor, which in myself I boldly will defend and interchangeably hurl down my gauge upon this overweening traitor's foot to prove myself a loyal gentleman even in the best blood chambered in his bosom, in haste whereof most heartily I pray your highness to assign our trial day. Rast, kindled gentlemen, be ruled by me. Let's purge this collar without letting blood. This we prescribed, though no physician. Deep malice makes too deep incision. Forget, forgive, conclude and be agreed. Our doctors say this is no month to bleed. Good uncle, let this end where it had begun. We'll calm the Duke of Norfolk. Norfolk, you your son. To be a make-peace shall become my age. Throw down my son the Duke of Norfolk's gauge. And Norfolk, throw down his. When, Harry, when? Obedience bids I should not bid again. Norfolk, throw down. We bid. There is no boot. Myself I throw, dread sovereign, at thy foot. My life thou shalt command, 
but not my shame, the one my duty owes, but my fair name, despite of death that lives upon my grave, to dark dishonours you thou shalt not have. I am disgraced, impeached, and baffled here, pierced to the soul with Sander's venomed spear, the which no balm can cure but his heart blood, which breathed this poison. Rage must be withstood. Give me his gage. Lions make leopards tame. Yea, but not change his spot. Take but my shame, and I resign my gage. My dear, dear lord, the purest treasure mortal times afford is spotless reputation. That away men are but gilded loam or painted clay. A jewel in a ten times barred up chest is a bold spirit in a loyal breast. Mine honour is my life, both grow in one. Take honour from me, and my life is done. Then, dear my liege, mine honour let me try. In that I live, and for that will I die. Cousin, throw up your gauge. Do you begin? Oh, God, defend my soul from such deep sin. Shall I seem crestfallen in my father's sight? Or with pale beggar fear impeach my height before this outdared dastard? Ere my tongue shall wound my honour with such feeble wrong, or sound so base a pall, my teeth shall tear the slavish motive of recanting fear, and spit it bleeding in this high disgrace, where shame does harbour, even in Mowbray's face. John of Gaunt exits. We were not born to sue, but to command. Which sins we cannot do to make you friends. Be ready, as your life shall answer it, at Coventry upon St. Lambert's Day. There shall your swords and lances arbitrate the swelling differences of your settled hate. Since we cannot atone you, we shall see justice decide the victor's chivalry. Lord Marshal, command our officers at arms, be ready to direct these home alarms. Everyone leaves. Scene two. The Duke of Lancaster's Palace. Enter John of Gaunt with the Duchess. Alas, the part I had in Woodstock's blood doth more solicit me than your exclaims to stir against the butchers of his life. But since correction lieth in those hands which made the faults that we cannot correct, but we are quarrelled to the will of heaven who, when they see the hours ripe on earth, will rain hot vengeance on offenders' heads. Finds brotherhood in thee no sharper spur? Hath love in thy old blood no living fire? Edward's seven sons, whereof thyself art one, were as seven vials of his sacred blood, or seven fair branches springing from one root. Some of those seven are dried by nature's course, some of those branches by the destinies cut, but Thomas, my dear lord, my life, my Gloucester, one vial full of Edward's sacred blood, one flourishing branch of his most royal root, is cracked, and all the precious liquor spilt, is hacked down, and his summer leaves all faded. By envy's hand and murder's bloody axe, ah, gaunt, his blood was thine, that bed, that wound, that metal, that self-mold that fashioned thee made him a man, and thou, and though thou livest and breathest, yet art thou slain in him, thou do dost consent in some large measure to thy father's death, in that thou seest thy wretched brother die, who was the model of thy father's life, call it not patience gaunt, it is despair, in suffering thus thy brother to be slaughtered, thou showest the naked pathway to thy life teaching stern murder how to butcher thee, that which in mean men we entitle patience, in pale, cold cowardice in noble breasts. What shall I say, to safeguard thine own life? The best way is to venge my Gloucester's death. God's the quarrel, for God's substitute. His deputy anointed in his sight hath caused his death, the which, if wrongfully, let heaven revenge. For I may never lift an angry arm against his master. Where then, alas, may I complain myself? To God, the widow's champion and defence. Why, then I will. Farewell, old Gaunt, thou goest to Coventry, there to behold our cousin Hereford and fellow Mowbray, 
fight. Oh, sit my husband's wrongs on Hereford's spear, that it may enter Butcher Mowbray's breast, or, if mis misfortune miss the first career, be Mowbray's sin so heavy in his bosom, they may break his fo foaming courser's back, and throw the rider headlong in the list. A caveat recrant to my cousin Hereford. Farewell, old, ga old gaunt. Thou sometimes brother's wife, with her companion grief, must end her life. Sister, farewell. I must to Coventry. As much good stay with thee as go with me. Yet one word more. Grief boundeth where it falls, not with empty hollowness, but weight. I take my leave before I have begun, for sorrow ends not when it seemeth done. Commend me to thy brother, Edmund York. Lo, this is all, nay, yet depart not so, though this be all, do not so quickly go. I shall remember more. Bid him, uh, what? With all good speed at Plashy visit me. Alack, and what shall good old York there see but empty lodgings and unfurnished walls, unpeopled offices, untrodden stones? And what here th there for welcome but my groans? Therefore commend me. Let me not come here to seek out sorrow that dwells everywhere. Desolate, desolate, will I hence and die. The last leave of thee takes my weeping eye. And everybody leaves. Scene three. The lists at Coventry. Enter the Lord Marshal and the Duke of Omeo. My Lord Omeo, is Harry Hereford armed? Yeah, at all points, and longs to enter in. Hath the Duke of Norfolk spritefully and bold stays but the summons of the appellant's trumpet? Uh, why then, the champions are prepared, and stay for nothing but his majesty's approach. The trumpet sound, and King Richard enters with his nobles, John of Gaunt, Boucher, Bagot, Green, and others. When they are set, enter Thomas Mowbray in arms, defendant with a herald. Marshal, demand of yonder, yonder champion the cause of his arrival here in arms. Ask him his name, and orderly proceed to swear him in the justice of his cause. In God's name and the King's, say who thou art, and why thou comest thus knightly clad in arms. Against what man thou comest, and what thy quarrel? Speak truly on thy knighthood and thy oath, as so defend thee heaven and thy valour. My name is Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, who hither comes, engaged by my oath, which God defend a knight should violate, both to defend my loyalty and truth to God, my king, and my succeeding issue, against the Duke of Hereford that appeals me, and by the grace of God and this mine arm, to prove him in defending of myself a traitor to my God, my king, and me. And as I truly fight, defend me, heaven. The trumpet sound. Entry, enter Henry Bolingbroke, appellant in armour with a herald. Marshal, ask yonder knight in arms both who he is, and why he comes hither thus plated in habiliments of war, and formally, according to our law, depose him in the justice of his cause. What is thy name, and wherefore comest thou hither, before King Richard in his royal lists? Against whom comest thou, and what's thy quarrel? Speak like a true knight, and so def uh, defend thee heaven. Ari of Hereford, Lancaster, and Derby am I, who ready here do stand in arms to prove by God's grace and my body's valour in lists on Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, that he is a traitor, foul and dangerous to God of heaven, King Richard, and to me. And as I truly fight, defend me heaven. Oh, on pain of death, no person be so bold or daring hardy as to touch the lists, except the marshal in such offices appointed to direct these fair designs. Lord Marshal, let me kiss my sovereign's hand, and bow my knee before his majesty. For Mowbray and myself are like two men that vow a long and weary pilgrimage. Then let us take a ceremonious leave, and loving farewell of several of our friends. The appellant, the appellant in all duty greets your highness, and craves to kiss your hand and take his leave. We will descend, and fold him in our arms. Cousin of Hereford, as thy cause is right, so, so be thy fortune in this royal fight. Farewell, my blood, which if today thou shed, lament we may, but not revenge thee dead. 
no, let no a noble eye profane a tear for me if I be gored with Mowbray's spear. As confident as is the falcon's flight against a bird do I with Mowbray fight. My loving lord, I take my leave of you. Of you, my no noble cousin, Lord or Merle, not sick, although I have to do with death, but lusty, young, and cheerly drawing breath. Lo, as at English feasts I so regret, the daintiest lass to make the end most sweet. O thou, the earthly author of my blood, whose youthful spirit in me regenerate, doth with a twofold vigour lift me up, to reach at victory above my head, add proof unto mine armour with thy prayers, and with thy blessings steal my lance's point, that it may enter Mowbray's waxen coat, and furbish new the name of John Agaunt, even in the lusty haviour of his son. God and thy good cause make thee prosperous, be swift like lightning in the execution. And let thy blows, doubly redoubled, fall like amazing thunder on the cask of thy adverse, pernicious enemy. Rouse up thy youthful blood, be valiant, and live. Thine innocency and St. George to thrive. However God or fortune cast my lot, there lives or dies, true to King Richard's throne, a loyal, just, and upright gentleman. Never did captive with a freer heart cast off his chains of bondage and embrace his golden, uncontrolled enfranchisement more than my dancing soul doth celebrate this feast of battle with mine adversary. Most mighty liege and my companion peers, take from my mouth the wish of happy years. As gentle and as jocund as to jest, go I to fight. Truth hath a quiet breast. Farewell, my lord. Securely I espy virtue with valour couched in thine eye. Order the trial, Marshal, and begin. Harry of, Her Harry of Hereford, Lancaster and Derby, receive thy lance, and God defend the right. Strong as a tower in hope, I cry Amen. Go bear this lance to Thomas, Duke of Norfolk. Harry of Hereford, Lancaster and Derby, stands here for God, his sovereign and himself, on pain to be found false and recreant, to prove the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray, a traitor to his God, his king and him, and dares him to set forward to the fight. Here standeth Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, on pain to be found false and recreant, both to defend himself and to prove Henry of Hereford, Lancaster and Derby, to God, his sovereign, and to him disloyal, courageously and with a free desire, attending but the signal to begin. Sound trumpets and set forward combatants. Stay, the king hath thrown his warder down. Let them lay by their helmets and their spear, and both return back to their cha chairs again. Withdraw with us, and let the trumpets sound, while we return these dukes what we decree. There's a long flourish. Draw near, and list what with our counsel we have done, for that our kingdom's earth should not be soiled with that dear blood which it hath fostered. And for our eyes do hate the dire aspect of civil wounds ploughed up with neighbour's sword, and for we think the eagle-winged pride of sky-aspiring and ambitious thought has rival-hating envy set on you to wake our peace which in our country's cradle draws the sweet infant breath of gentle sleep, which so roused up with boisterous untuned drums, with harsh resounding trumpets dreadful bray and grating shock of wrathful iron arms, might from our quiet confines fright fair peace and make us wade even in our kindred's blood. Therefore, we banish you our territories. You, Cousin Hereford, upon pain of life, till twice five summers have enriched our fields, shall not regret our fair dominions, but thread the stranger's path of banishment. Your will be done. This must my comfort be. Sun that warms you here shall shine on me, and those his golden beams to you here lent shall point on me and gild my banishment. Norfolk, 
For thee remains a heavier doom, which I with some unwillingness pronounce. The sly slow hours shall not determinate the dateless limit of thy dear, dear exile. The hopeless word of never to return breathe I against thee upon pain of life. A heavy sentence, my most sovereign liege, and all looked unlooked for from your highness's mouth. A dearer merit, not so deep a maim as to be cast forth in the common air, have I deserved at your highness's hand. The language I have learned these forty years, my native English, must I forego. And now my tongue's use is no more to me than an unstringed vial or a harp, or like a cunning instrument cased up, or, being open, put into his hands that knows no touch to tune the harmony within my mouth. You haven't gallowed my tongue, doubly portcullised with my teeth and lips, and dull, unfeeling, barren ignorance is made my gallower to attend on me. I am too old to fawn upon a nurse, too far in years to be a pupil now. What is thy sentence then but speechless death, which robs my tongue from breathing native breath? It boots thee not to be compassionate. After our sentence, plaining comes too late. Then thus I turn me away from my country's light to dwell in solemn shades of endless night. Return again, I take an oath with thee. Lay on our royal sword your banished hands. Swear by the duty that you owe to God. Our part therein we banish with ourselves to keep the oath that we administer. You never shall, so help you truth and God, embrace, e embrace each other's love in banishment. Nor never look upon each other's face, nor never write, regret, nor reconcile this lowering tempest of your homebred hate. Nor never be advised purpose meet to plot, contrive, or complot any ill against us, our state, our subjects, or our land. I swear. And I to keep all this. Norfolk, so far as to mine enemy, by this time had the king permitted us, one of our souls had wandered in the air, banished this veiled sepulchre of our flesh, as now our flesh is banished from this land. Confess thy treasons, ere thy fly the realm, since thou hast far to go, bear not along the clogging burthen of a guilty soul. No, Bolingbroke, if ever I were traitor, my name be blotted from the book of life, and I from heaven banished as from hence. But what thou art, God, thou, and I do know, and all too soon I fear the king shall rue. Farewell, my liege, now no way can I stray, save back to England and all the world's my way. He exits. Uncle, even in the glasses of thine eyes I see thy grieving heart. Thy sad aspect hath from the number of his banished years plucked four away. To Henry Bolingbroke. Six frozen winters spent. Return with welcome home from banishment. How long a time lies in one little word? Four lagging winters and four wanton springs end in a word. Such is the breath of kings. I think, my liege, that in regard of me, he shortens four years of my son's exile. But little advantage shall I reap thereby, for ere the six years that he hath to spend can change their moons and bring their times about, my oil-dried lamp and time the wasted light shall be extinct with age and endless night. My inch of taper will be burnt and done, and blindfold death not let me see my son. Why, uncle, thou hast many years to live. But not a minute, king, that thou canst give. Shorten my days thou canst with sullen sorrow, and pluck nights from me, but not lend a morrow. Thou canst help time to furrow me with age, but stop no wrinkle in this pilgrimage. Thy word is current with him for my death, but dead thy kingdom cannot buy my breath. Thy son is banished upon good advice, whereto thy tongue a party verdict gave. Why, at our justice, seem thou then to lower? Things sweet to taste, 
proven digestion sour you urged me as a judge but i had rather you would have bid me argue like a father oh had it been a stranger not my child to smooth his fault i should have been more mild a partial slander sought i to avoid and in the sentence my own life destroyed alas i looked when some of you should say i was too straight to make my own away but you gave leave to my unwilling tongue against my will to do myself this wrong cousin farewell and uncle bid him so six years we banish him and he shall go there's a flourish then king richard the second and his train exits cousin farewell what presents must not know from where you do remain let paper show my lord no leave take i for i will ride as far as land will let me by your side Oh, to what purpose dost thou hoard thy words, that thou return'st no greeting to thy friends? I have too few to take my lead of view. When the tongue's office should be prodigal to breathe the abundant dollar of the heart. Thy grief is but thy absence for a time. Oi, absent. Grief is present for that time. What is six winters? They are quickly gone. The men enjoy, but grief makes one hour ten. Call it a travel that thou takest for pleasure. My heart will sigh when I miscall it so, which binds it an enforced pilgrimage. The sullen passage of thy weary steps, esteem as foil wherein thou art to set, precious jewel of thy home return. Nay, rather. Every tedious stride I make will but remember me what a deal of world I wander from the jewels that I love. Must I not serve a long apprenticehood to foreign pastures, and in the end, having my freedom, both nothing, boast nothing else but that I was a journeyman to grief? All places the eye of heaven visit are to a wise man ports and happy havens. Teach thy necessity to reason thus. There is no virtue like necessity. Think not the king did banish thee, but thou the king. Woe doth the heavier sit, where it proceeds, it is but faintly borne. Go. Say I sent thee forth to purchase honour, and not the king exiled thee, or suppose devouring pestilence hangs in our air, and thou art flying to a fresher clime. Look. What thy soul holds dear, imagine it, to lie that way thou goest, not whence thou comest. Suppose the singing birds musicians, the grass whereon thou treadst the present strewed, flowers fair ladies, and thy steps no more than a delightful measure or dance, for gnarling sorrow hath less power to bite than man that mocks at it and sets it light. Oh, who can hold a fire in his hand by thinking on the frosty Caucasus? or cloy the hungry edge of appetite by bare imagination of a feast, or wallow naked in December snow by thinking on fantastic summer's heat. Oh no, the apprehension of the good gives but the greater feeling to the worse. Fell sorrow's tooth doth never rankle more than when he bites but lanceth not the sore. Come, come, my son, I'll bring thee on thy way. Had I thy use and cause, I would not stay. Then, England's ground, farewell. Sweet soil, adieu. My mother and my nurse that bears me yet. Where'er I wander, boast of this I can. Though banished, yet a true-born Englishman. And everyone leaves. Scene four, the court. Enter King Richard the Second with Bagot and Green at one door, and the Duke of Ormel at another. We did observe. Cousin Ormel, how far brought you High Hereford on his way? I brought High Hereford, if you call him so, but to the next highway, and there I left him. And say, what star of parting tears were shed? Faith, none for me, except the northeast wind, which then blew bitterly against our faces, awaked the sleeping room, and so by chance did grace our hollow parting with a tear. What said our cousin when you parted with him? Farewell. 
and for my heart disdained by uh, and for my heart disdained that my tongue should so profane the word that taught me craft to counterfeit oppression of such grief that word seemed buried in my sorrow's grave marry would the word farewell have lengthened hours and added years to this short banishment he should have had a volume of farewells but since it would not he had none of me he is our cousin cousin but is doubt when time shall call him home from banishment whether our kinsmen come to see his friends ourselves and bushy back at here and green observe his courtship to the common people how he did seem to dive into their hearts with humble and familiar courtesy what reverence he did throw away on slaves, poor, woeing poor craftsmen with the craft of smiles and patient underbearing of his fortune. As to to banish, there are facts with him. Off goes his bonnet to an oyster wench. A brace of draymen did God speed him well, and had the tribute of his supple knee with thanks, my countrymen, my lovely friends, as were our England in revision his and he our subjects next degree in hope well he is gone and with him go these thoughts now for the rebels which stand out in ireland expedient manage must be made my liege ere further leisure yield them further means for their advantage and your highness loss we will ourselves in person to this war and for our covers the too great accord and liberal larges are grown somewhat light. We are enforced to farm our royal realm. The revenue whereof shall furnish us for our affairs in hand. If that come short, our substitutes at home shall have blank charges. Where to, when we shall know what men are rich, they shall subscribe them for large sums of gold and send them after the supplier wants. For we will make for Ireland presently. Enter Bushy. Bushy, what news? Old John of Gaunt is grievous sick, my lord, suddenly taken, and hath sent post haste to entreat your majesty to visit him. Well, I see. At Eli Hale. Now put it, God, in the physician's mind, to help him to his grave immediately. The lining of his coffers shall make coats to deck our soldiers for these Irish wars. Come, gentlemen, let's all go visit him. Pray God we may make haste and come too late. Amen. Amen. And everybody exits. Act 2, Scene 1, Eli House. Enter John of Gaunt, sick, with the Duke of York and company. <coughs> Will the king come? that I may breathe my last in wholesome counsel to his unstayed youth. Vex not yourself, nor strive not with your breath, for all in vain comes counsel to his ear. Oh, but they say the tongues of dying men enforce attention like deep harmony. Where words are scarce, they are seldom spent in vain. If they breathe truth, it breathes their words in pain. He that no more must say is listened more than they who mute and ease have taught to glows. More are men's ends marked than their lives before the setting sun and music at the close. But the last taste of sweet is sweet as last, writ in remembrance more than things long past. Though Richard my life's counsel would not hear, my death's sad tale may yet be deaf his ear. No, it is stopped with other flattering sounds, as praises of those whose taste the wise are fond. Lash riches meters to whose venom sound the open ear of youth doth always listen. Report of fashions in proud Italy, whose manners still our tardy apish nation limbs after in base imitation. Where doth the world thrust forth a vanity? So it be new, there's no respect how vile that is not quickly bust into his ears. Then all too late comes counsel to be heard. Where will doth mutiny with wit's regard? Direct not him whose way himself will choose. Tis breath thou lackest, and that breath wilt thou lose. He thinks I am a prophet, new inspired, and thus expiring do foretell of him. His rash, fierce blaze of riot cannot last, for violent fires soon burn out themselves. Small showers last long, but sudden storms are short. He tires for times that spur too fast for time. With eager feeding, food doth choke the feeder, 
light vanity, insatiate cormorant, consuming mean soon praise among itself. The royal throne of kings, this sceptred isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war. This happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea, which serves it in the office of a wall, or as a moat defensive to a house, against the envy of less happier lands, this blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England, this nurse, this teeming womb of royal kings, feared by their breed and famous by their birth, renowned for their deeds as far from home for Christian service and true chivalry, as, in this, as is the sepulchre and stone of Jewry of the world's ransom. Blessed Mary's son, this land of such dear souls, this dear, dear land, dear for her reputation through the world, is now leased out. I die, pronouncing it, like to a tenement or pelting farm, England bound in with a triumphant sea whose rocky shore beats back the envious siege. Watery Neptune is now bound in with shame, with inky blots and rotten parchment bronze. That England, that was wont to conquer us, had made a shameful conquest of itself. Ah, oh, would the scandal vanish with my life? How happy then were in my pursuing death. Enter King Richard the Second and Queen, Duke of Omel, Bushy Green, Baggett, Lord Ross, and Lord Willoughby. The king is come. Deal mildly with his youth, for young hot colds being raged do rage the more. How fares our noble uncle Lancaster? What comfort, man? How is't with aged, aged gaunt? Oh, how that name befits my composition. Old gaunt indeed, and gaunt in being old. Within me grief hath kept a tedious fast, and who abstains from meat that is not gaunt? For sleeping England long time have I watched. Watching breeds leanness. Leanness is all gaunt. The pleasure that some fathers feed upon is my strict fast. I mean, my children's looks. And therein fasting hast thou made me gaunt. Gaunt am I for the grave. Gaunt as a grave, whose hollow womb inherits naught but bones. Can sick men play so nicely with their names? No, misery makes sport to mock itself, since thou dost seek to kill my name in me. I mock my name, great king, to flatter thee. Should dying men flatter with those that live? No, no, men living flatter those that die. Thou now a dying, say thou flatterest me. Oh, no, thou diest, though I the sicker be. I am in health, I breathe, and see thee ill. Now he that made me knows I see thee ill, ill in myself to see, and in thee seeing ill. Thy deathbed is no lesser than thy land, wherein thou liest in reputation sick, and thou, too careless patient as thou art, commitst thy anointed body to the cure of those physicians that first wounded thee. A thousand flatterers sit within thy crown, whose compass is no bigger than thy head, and yet, encaged in so small a verge, the waste is no whit lesser than thy land. Oh, had thy grandsire the prophet's eye seen how his son's son should destroy his sons, from forth thy reach he would have laid thy shame, deposing thee before thou wert possessed, which art possessed now to depose thyself. Why, cousin, wert thou regent of the world, it were a shame to let this land by lease, but for thy world enjoying but this land, is it not more shame than to shame it so? Landlord of England art thou now, not king. Thy state of law is bondslave to the law, and thou... A lunatic, lean-witted fool, presuming on an agus privilege, darest with thy frozen admission make pale our cheek, chasing the royal blood with fury from his native resident. Now, by my seat's right royal majesty, Wert thou not brother to great Eng Edward's son, thy tongue that run so roundly in thy head should run thy head from thy unreverent shoulders. Oh, spare me not, my brother Edward's son, for that I was his father Edward's son, that blood already 
like the pelican hast thou tapped out and drunkenly caroused my brother gloucester plain well-meaning soul whom fair befall in heaven amongst happy souls may be a precedent and a witness good that thou respects not spilling edward's blood join with the present sickness that i have and thy unkindness be like crooked age crop at once a long too long withered flower live in thy shame but die not shame with thee these words hereafter thy tormentors be convey me to my bed then to my grave love they to live that love and honour have he exits borne off by his attendants and let them die that age and sullen have for both hast thou and both become the grave i i do beseech your majesty impute his words to wayward sickliness and age in him he loves you on my life and holds you dear as harry duke of hereford were he here right you say true as hereford's love so his as theirs so mine and i'll be as it is northumberland enters my leash old gaunt commends him to your majesty what says he nay Nothing, all is said, his tongue is now a stringless instrument, words, life, and all, old Lancaster hath spent. Be York the next that must be bankrupt so, though death be poor, it ends a mortal woe. The ripest fruit first falls, and so doth he, his time is spent, our pilgrimage must be. <sighs> So much for that. Now for our Irish wars. We must supplant, uh, supplant those rough, rock-headed kerns, which live like venom when no venom else, but only they have privilege to live. For these great affairs to ask some change, towards our assistance we do cease to us, the plate, corn, revenue, and movables, whereof our Uncle Gaunt did stand possessed. How long shall I be patient? Oh, how long shall tender duty make me suffer wrong? Not Gloucester's death, nor Hereford's banishment, not Gaunt's rebukes, nor England's private wrongs, nor the prevention of poor Bolingbroke about his marriage, nor my own disgrace, have ever made me sour my patient cheek, or bend one wrinkle on my sovereign's face. I am the last of noble Edward's sons, of whom thy father, Prince of Wales, was first, in war was never lion raged more fierce in peace was never gentle lamb more mild then was that young and pridesly gentleman his face thou hast for even so looked he accomplished with the number of thy hours but when he frowned it was against the french and not against his friends his noble hand did will what he did spend and spent not that which his triumphant father's hand had won his hands were guilty of no kindred blood but bloody with the enemies of his kin. Oh, Richard, York is too far gone with grief, or else he never would compare between. Why, uncle, what's the matter? Oh, my liege, pardon me if you please, if not I pleased. Not to be pardoned, I am content with all. Seek you to seize and gripe into your hands the royalties and rights of banished Hereford. Is not gone dead, and doth not Hereford live? Was not Gaunt just, and is not Harry true? Did not the one deserve to have an heir? Is not his heir a well-deserving son? Take Hereford's rights away, and take from time his charters and his customary rights. Let not tomorrow then ensue today. Be not thyself, for how art thou a king but by fair sequence and succession? Now, afore God, God forbid I say true, if you do wrongfully seize Hereford's rights, call in the letters patent that he hath, by his attorney's general to sue his livery and deny his offered homage. You pluck a thousand dangers on your head, you lose a thousand well-disposed heart, and prick my tender patience to those thoughts which honour and allegiance cannot think. Think what you will, we seize into our hands his plate, his good, his money, and his lands. I'll not be by the while, my liege. Farewell. What will ensue hereof, there's none can tell, but by bad courses may be understood that their events can never fall out good. And he exits. Go, Bushy, to the Earl of Wiltshire Strait. Bid him repair to us Eli House to see this business. Tomorrow next we will for Ireland. 
And this time I throw and we create in absence of ourself, our Uncle York, Lord Governor of England. For he is just and always loved us well. Come on, our Queen. Tomorrow we will, must repart. Be merry, for our time of stay is short. There's a flourish, and King Richard II, the Queen, Duke of Ormel, Bushy, Green and Bagot all exit. Well, lords, the Duke of Lancaster is dead. And living, too, for now his son is Duke. Mm, barely in title, not in revenue. Richly in both, if justice had her right. My heart is great. But it must break with silence, et be disturbed with a liberal tongue. Nay, speak thy mind, and let him ne'er speak more. That speaks thy words again do to do thee harm. Tends that thou wouldst speak to the Duke of Hereford. If it be so, out with it boldly, man. Quick as mine ear to hear of good towards him. No good at all that I can do for him, unless you call it good to pity him, bereft and gilded off his patrimony. Now, afore God, tis shame such wrongs are born. In him, a royal prince and many mo of noble blood in this declining land. The king is not himself, but barely led by flatterers, and what they will inform merely in hate against any of us all. That will the king severely prosecute against us, our lives, our children, and our heirs. The commons hath he pilled with grievous taxes, and quite lost their hearts. The nobles hath he fined for ancient quarrels, and quite lost their hearts. And daily new exactions are devised, as blanks, benevolences, and I want, uh, and I what not want. And I what not what, but what, O oh God's name, doth become of this? Wars have not wasted it, for ward he hath not but barely yielded upon compromise that which his noble ancestors achieved with blows. More hath he spent in peace than they in wars. The Earl of Wiltshire hath the realm in farm. The king's grown bankrupt like a broken man. Reproach and dissolution hangeth over him. He hath not money for these Irish wars. His burdenous taxations notwithstanding, but by the robbing of the banished duke. His noble kinsman, most degenerate king, but, lords, we hear this fearful tempest sing, yet see no shelter to avoid the storms. We see the wind sit sore upon our sails, and yet we strike not, but securely perish. We see the very wreck that we must suffer, and unavoided is the danger now, for suffering so the causes of our wreck. Not so. Even though the hollow eyes of death I spy life peering, but I dare not say how near the tidings of our comfort is. Nay, let us share thy thoughts as, do uh, as thou dost stars. Be confident to speak, Northumberland. We three are but thyself, and speaking so, thy words are as but thoughts, therefore be bold. Then thus, I have from Port Leblanc, a bay in Brittany, received intelligence that Harry, Duke of Hereford, Reynold Lord Cobham, that late broke from the Duke of Exeter, his brother, Archbishop, late of Canterbury, Sir Thomas Ebringham, Sir John Ramston, Sir John Norbury, Sir Robert Waterton, and Francis Quant, all these well furnished by the Duke of Britannia. With eight tall ships, three thousand men of war are making hither with all due expedience, and shortly mean to touch our northern shore. Perhaps they had ere this, but that they say, their first departing for, of the king for Ireland. If then we shall shake off our slavish yoke, imp out our drooping country's broken wing, redeem from broken pawn and thou the blemished crown, wipe off the dust that hides our scepter's guilt, and make high majesty look like itself, away with me and post to Ravensburg. But if you faint as fearing to do so, stay and be secret, and myself will go. To horse, to horse, urge doubts to them that fear. Hold out my horse, and I'll be first there. And everybody leaves. Scene two, the palace. Enter the queen, Bushy and Bagot. Madam, your majesty is too much sad. 
You promised when you parted with the king to lay aside life, harm, and heaviness, and entertain a cheerful disposition. To please the king, I did. To please myself, I cannot do it. Yet I know no cause why I should, I should welcome such a guest as grief, save bidding farewell to so sweet a guest as my sweet Richard. Yet again, methinks, some unborn sorrow ripe in fortune's womb is coming towards me and in my inward soul with nothing trembles. At something it grieves more than with parting from my lord, the king. Each substance of a grief hath twenty shadows, which shows like grief itself, but is not so. For sorrow's eye, glazed with blind and tears, divides one thing entire to many objects, like perspectives, which rightly gazed upon show nothing but confusion, hide or eye, distinguished form. So, your sweet majesty, find, looking awry from upon your lord's departure, find shapes of grief, more than himself, to wail, which, looked on as it is, is not but shadows of what it is not. Then, thrice gracious queen, more than your lord's departure, weep not, more's not seen, or if it be, tis with false sorrow's eye, which for things true weep things imagine. It may be so. But yet my inward soul persuades me it is otherwise. However it be, I cannot but be sad. So heavy sad as the one thinking on no thought I think makes me with heavy nothing faint and drink. Tis nothing but conceit, my gracious lady. <laughs> Tis nothing less. Conceit is still derived from some forefather grief. Mine is not so, for nothing hath begot my something grief, or something hath nothing that I grieve. This in reversion that I do possess, but what it is, that is not yet known. What I cannot name, this nameless woe I wot. Green enters. God save your Majesty, and well met, gentlemen. I hope the king is not yet shipped for Ireland. Why hope is though so? Tis better hope he is, for his designs crave him. Then wherefore does thou hope he is not shipped? That he or hope might have retired his power, and driven into despair an enemy's hope who strongly hath set footing in his land. The banished bowling brook repeals himself, and with uplifted arms is safe arrived at Ravensburg. Now God in heaven forbid! Ah, <laughs> oh, madam, tis too true, and that is worse. The Lord Northumberland, his son young Henry Percy, the lords of Ross, Bowman, and Willoughby, with all their powerful friends, have fled to him. Why have you not proclaimed Northumberland and all the rest revolted faction traitors? We have, whereupon the Earl of Worcester hath broke his staff, resigned his stewardship, and all the household servants fled with him to Bolingbroke. So, Green, thou art the midwife to my woe, and Bolingbroke my sorrow's dismal heir. Now hath my soul brought for her prodigy, and I, a gasping new delivered mother, have woe to woe, sorrow to sorrow joint. Despair not, madam. Who shall hinder me? I will despair, and be at enmity with causing me hope. He is a flutterer, a parasite, a keeper, a bag of death, who gently would dissolve it, the bands of life which false hope lingers in extremity. The Duke of York enters. Here comes the Duke of York. With signs of war about his ancient neck. Oh, full of careful business are his looks. Uncle, for God's sake, speak of the words. Should I do so, I should belie my thoughts. Comfort's in heaven, and we are on the earth, where nothing lives but crosses, cares, and grief. Your husband, he is gone to save far off, whilst others come to make him lose at home. Here am I, left to underprop his land, 
who, weak with age, cannot support myself. Now comes the sick hour that his surfeit made. Now shall he try his friends that flattered him. A servant enters. My lord, your son was gone before I came. He was? Why, so, go all which way you will. The nobles, they are fled, the commons, they are cold, and will, I fear, revolt on Hereford's side. Sirrah, get thee to Plashy, to my sister Gloucester. Bid her send me presently a thousand pound. Hold, take my ring. My lord, I had forgot to tell your lordship. Uh, today, as I came by, I called there, but I shall grieve you to report the rest. What is it, knave? There, before I came, the Duchess died. God, God for his mercy! What a tide of woes comes rushing on this woeful land at once. I know not what to do. I would to God so my untruth had not provoked him to it. The king had cut off my head with my brothers. What, are there no posts dispatched for Ireland? How shall we do for money for these wars? Come, sister, cousin, I would say. Pray, pardon me. Go, fellow, get thee home. Provide some carts and bring away the armour that is there. And the servant exits. Gentlemen, will you go, master men? I know how or which way to order these affairs. Thus thrust disorderly into my hands. Never believe me, both are my kinsmen. The one is my sovereign, whom both my oath and my duty bids defend. The other, again, is by kingsmen, whom the king hath wronged, whom conscience and my kindred bids to right. Well, somewhat we must do. Come, cousin, I'll dispose of you. Gentlemen, go, muster up your men, and meet me presently at Berkeley. I should do plashy too. The time will not permit, all is uneven, and everything is left at six and seven. And the Duke of York and the Queen leaves. The wind sits fair for news to go to Ireland, but none returns. For us to levy power proportionable to the enemies, all impossible. Besides, our nearness to the king in love is near the hate of those love not the king. And that's the waver in commons, for their love lies in their purses, and whoso empties them, by so much fills their hearts with deadly hate. Wherein the king stands generally condemned. It judgment lie in them, then so do we, because we ever have been near the king. Well, I will for refuge strike to Bristle Castle. The Earl of Wiltshire is already there. Thither will I with you, for the lawfest the hateful commons we perform for us, except like curves to tear us all to pieces. Will you go along with us? No, I will to Ireland, to his majesty. Farewell, if hearts presages be not vain. <laughs> we three. Here art that ne'er shall meet again. That's as York thrives to beat that bone, bro. Alas, poor Duke, the task he undertakes is numbering sands and drinking oceans dry. Where one on his side finds, thousands will fly. Farewell at once, for once, for all, and ever. Well, 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 we may meet again. I fear me, never. And everybody leaves. Scene 3. Wilds in Gloucestershire. Enter Henry Bolingbroke and Northumberland with forces. How far is it, my lord, to Barclay now? Believe me, noble lord, I am a stranger here in Gloucestershire. These high, wild hills and rough, uneven ways draw out our miles and makes them wearisome. And yet your fair discourse hath been as sugar, making the hard way sweet and delectable. But I bethink me what a weary way from Ravensburg to Cotswold will be found, and Ross and Willowsby wanting your company, which I protest hath very much beguiled the tediousness and process of my travel, but theirs is sweetened with the hope to have the present benefit which I possess, and hope to joy is left in joy than hope enjoyed. By this the weary lord shall make their way seem short as mine hath done, by sight of what ha I have your noble company. Of much less value is my company than your good words. But who comes here? Enter Henry Percy Hotspur. It is my son, 
and young Henry, Harry Percy, sent for my brother Worcestershire, when soever, Harry, how fares your uncle? I had thought, my lord, to have learned his health of you. Why, is he not with the queen? No, my good lord, he hath forsook the court, broken his staff of office, and dispersed the household of the king. What was his reason? He was not so resolved when we last spake together. Because your lordship was proclaimed traitor. But he, my lord, is gone to Ravensburg to offer service to the Duke of Hereford, and sent me over by Berkeley to discover what power the Duke of York had levied there, then with directions to repair to Ravensburg. Have you forgot the Duke of Hereford, boy? No, my good lord, for that is not forgot, which ne'er I did remember. To my knowledge, I never in my life did look on him. Then learn to know him now. This is the duke. My gracious lord, I tender you my service, such as it is being tender, raw, and young, which elder day shall ripen and confirm to more approved service and desert. Thank thee, gentle Percy. And be sure, I count myself in nothing else so happy as in a soul remembering my good friends. And, as my fortune ripens with thy love, it shall be still thy true love's recompense. My heart this covenant makes, my hands thus seals it. How far is it to Barclay, and what stir keeps good old York there with his men of war? There stands the castle by yon tuft of trees, manned with three hundred men, as I have heard, and in it are the lords of York, Barclay, and Seymour, none else of name and noble estimate. Enter Lord Ross and Lord Willoughby. Here comes the Lord of Ross and Willoughby, bloody with spurring, fiery red with hate. Welcome, my lords. I wot your love pursues a banished traitor. All my treasury is yet but unfelt thanks, which more enrich shall be your love and labour's recompense. Your presence makes us rich, most noble lord. And fast amounts our labour to attain it. For more thanks, the exchequer of the poor, which till my infant fortune comes to years, stands for my bounty. But who comes here? Enter Lord Berkeley. It is my lord of Berkeley, as I guess. My lord of Hereford, my message is to you. My lord, my answer is to Lancaster, <coughs> and I am come to seek that name in England, and I must find that title in your tongue before I make a reply to aught you say. Mistake me not, my lord, tis not my meaning to raise one title of your honour out. To you, my lord, I come what lord you will. For the most gracious regent of this land, the Duke of York, to know what tricks you are, and to take advantage of the absent time, and fright our native peace with self-born arm. Enter Duke of York with attendance. Shall not need to transport my words by you. Here comes his grace in person. My noble uncle. He kneels. Show me thy humble heart, and not thy knee whose duty is deceivable and false. My gracious uncle. Tut, tut. Grace me no grace, nor uncle me no uncle. I'm no traitor's uncle, and that word grace in an ungracious mouth is but profane. Why have those banished and forbidden legs dared once to touch a dust of England's ground? But then more why, why have they dared to march so many miles upon their peaceful bosom? fighting her pale-faced villages with war and ostentation of despised arms. Comest thou because the anointed king is hence? Why, foolish boy, the king is left behind, and in my loyal bosom lies his power. Were I but now the lord of such hot youth, as when brave Gaunt, my father, and myself, rescued the black prince and young mass of men, from forth the ranks of many thousand French, then how quickly should this arm of mine 
now prisoner to the palsy, chastise thee, and minister correction to thy fault. My gracious uncle, let me know my fault. On what condition stands this and wherein? Even in condition of the worst degree, in gross rebellion and attested treason. Thou art a banished man, and here art come, before the expiration of thy time, in braving arms against thy sovereign. As I was banished, I was banished Hereford. But as I come, I come for Lancaster. And, noble uncle, I beseech your grace, look on my wrongs with an indifferent eye. You are my father, for methinks in you I see old Gaunt alive. Oh then, my father, will you permit that I shall stand condemned a wandering vagabond, my rights and royalties plucked from my arms perforce and given away to upstart unfrifts? Wherefore was I born? If that my cousin king be king of England, it must be granted I am Duke of Lancaster. You have a son, O'Merle, my noble cousin. Had you first died, and he be thus trod down, he should have found his uncle Gaunt a father, to rouse his wrongs and chase them to the bay. I am denied to sue my livery here, and yet my letter's patents give me leave. My father's goods are all distrained and sold, and these and all are amiss employed. What would you have me do? I am a subject, and I challenge the law. Attorneys are denied me, and therefore I personally lay my claim to my inheritance of free descent. The noble duke hath been too much abused. It stands on your grace to upon him to do him right. Base men by his endowments are made great. My lords of England, let me tell you this. I have had feeling of my cousin's wrongs, and laboured all I could do to do him right. But in this kind to come in braving arms, be his own carver, and cut out his way. To find out right with wrong it may not be, and you that do abet him in this kind, cherish rebellion, and are rebels all. The noble duke hath sworn his coming is but for his own, and for the right of that we all have strongly sworn to give him aid. And let him ne'er see joy that breaks that oath. Well, well, I see the issue of these arms. I cannot mend it, I must needs confess, because my power is weak and all ill left. But if I could, by him that gave me life, I would attach you all and make you stoop unto the sovereign mercy of the king. But since I cannot, be it known to you, I do remain as neuter. So fare you well. Unless you please to enter in the castle, and there repose you for this night. An, an offer, offer, Uncle. Oh, do you want to go? Or an offer, Uncle, that we will accept. But we must win your grace to go with us to Bristol Castle, which they say is held by Bushy, Baggett, and their uh, and their complices, the caterpillars of the Commonwealth, which I have sworn to weed and pluck away. It may be I will go with you. But yet I'll pause, for I am loath to break our country's laws. No friends, no foes, to me, welcome you are. Things past redress are now with me, past care. And everybody leaves. 
Scene four, a camp in Wales. Enter Earl of Salisbury and a Welsh captain. I can't do a Welsh accent, so we're just going to discuss it. My lord of Salisbury, we have stayed ten days and hardly kept our countrymen together, and yet we hear no tidings from the king. Therefore, we will disperse ourselves. Farewell. Stay yet another day, thou trusty Welshman. The king reposeth all his confidence in thee. Tis thought the king is dead. We will not stay. The bay trees in our country are all withered, and meteors fight the fixed stars of heaven. The pale-faced moon looks bloody on the earth, and lean-looked prophets whisper fearful change. The rich men look sad, and ruffians dance and leap, the one in fear to lose what they enjoy, the other to enjoy by raging war. These signs forerun the death or fall of kings. Farewell. Our countrymen are gone and fled, as well assured Richard that king is dead. And the captain leaves. Ah, Richard, with the eyes of heavy mind, I see thy glory like a shooting star, fall to the base earth from the firmament. Thy sun, set, uh, thy sun sets weeping in the lowly west, witnessing storms to come. The weight upon thy foes and crossly to thy good all fortune goes. And the air leaves. And this is where we'll be taking intermission.
Welcome back. Act three, scene one. Bristol before the castle. Enter Henry Bolingbroke, Duke of York, Northumberland, Lord Ross, Henry Percy, Hotspur, Lord Willoughby, with Bushy and Green and prisoners. Bring forth these men. Bushy and Green, I will not vex your souls, since presently your souls must part your bodies. With too much urging your pernicious lives, for twere no charity yet to wash your blood from off my hands. Here, in the view of men, I will unfold some causes of your deaths. You have misled a prince, a royal king, a happy gentleman in blood and liniments, by you unhappied and disfigured clean. You have in manner with your sinful hours made a divorce betwixt his queen and him, broke the possession of a royal bed and stained the beauty of a fair queen's cheeks with tears drawn from her eyes by your foul wrongs. Myself, a prince, by fortune of my blood, near to the king in blood and near in love, till you did make him misinterpret me have stooped my neck under your injuries and sighed my English breath in foreign clouds, eating the bitter bread of banishment whilst you have fed upon my signories, disparked my parks and felled my forest woods from my own windows, torn my household coat, raised my impress leaving me no sign saves men opinion and my living blood to show the world i am a gentleman this and much more much more than twice all this condemns you to the death see them delivered over to execution and the hands of death more welcome is the stroke of death to me than bolingbroke to england lords Farewell. My comfort is that heaven will take our souls and plague injustice with the pains of hell. And Lord Northumberland, see them dispatched. Northumberland and others leave with the prisoners. Uncle, you say the Queen is in your house. For God's sake, fairly let her be entreated. Tell her I send my kind commends. Take special care my greeting be delivered. A gentleman of mine I have dispatched, with letters of your love to her at large. Thank, gentle uncle. Come, lords, away, to fight with Glendower and his complices. A while to work, and after, holiday. And everybody leaves. Scene two, the coast of Wales, a castle in view. Drums flourish and colours. Enter King Richard II, the Bishop of Carlisle. Duke of Ormel and soldiers. Fuck, lovely castle, call this, they this at hand. Yeah, my lord. How brooks your grace the air after your late tossing on the breaking seas? Niece, must I like it well? I weep for joy to stand upon my kingdom once again. Dear earth, I do salute thee with my hand. Though rebels won't be with thy horse's hoofs, as a long-parted mother with her child, plays fondly with her tears and smiles in meeting, so weeping, smiling, greet I thee, my earth, and do thee favours with my royal hands. Feed not thy sovereign's foe, my gentle earth, nor with thy sweet comfort his ravenous sense, but let thy spiders that suck up thy venom and heavy-gated tobes lie in their way, doing annoyance to the treacherous feet which with usurping steps do tremble thee. Yield stinging nettles to mine enemies, and from they, and when they from thy bosom pluck a flower, guard it, I pray thee, with a lurking adder, whose double tongue may with a mortal touch throw death upon thy sovereign's enemies. Mock not my senseless conjuration, lords. This earth shall have a feeling, and these stones prove armed soldiers, 
ere her native king shall falter under foul rebellion's arms. Fear not, my lord. That power that made you king hath power to keep you king in spite of all. The means that heaven yields must be embraced and not neglected, else if heaven would, and we will not, heaven's offer we refuse, proper means of succour and yes. He means, my lord, that we are too remiss. Whilst Bowling broke through, our security grows strong and, in great in, and great in substance and in power. This comfortable's cousin, knowst thou not that when the searching eye of heaven is hid behind the globe that lights that lower world, then thieves and robbers range abroad unseen in murders and in outrage, boldly here? From when... But when from under this terrestrial ball he fires the proud tops of the eastern pines and darts his light through every guilty hole, then murders, treason, and detested sins, the cloak of night for being plucked from off their backs, stand bare and naked, trembling at themselves. So when this thief, this traitor, boiling brook, who all this while hath revelled in the night while we were wandering with the Antipodes, shall see us rising in our throne, the east. His treason will sit blushing on his face, not able to endure the sight of day, but self-affrightened trembled at his sin. Not all the water in the rough rude sea can wash the balm from off from an anointed king. The breath of wealthy men cannot oppose the de deputy elected by the Lord. For every man the boiling brook has pressed to lift shrewd steel against our golden crown. God for his Richard hath in heavenly pay a glorious angel. Then if angels fight, weak men must fall, for heaven still guards the right. The Earl of Salisbury enters. Welcome, my lord. How far off lies your power? Nor near nor farther off, my gracious lord, than this weak arm. Discomfort guides my tongue and bides me speak of nothing but despair. One day too late, I fear me, noble lord, hath clouded all thy happy days on earth. O oh, call back yesterday, bid time return, and thou shalt have twelve thousand fighting men. Today, today, unhappy day, too late, overthrow as thy joys, friends, fortune, and thy state, for all the Welshmen hearing thou wert dead, are gone to Bolingbroke, dispersed and fled. Comfort, my liege, why looks your grace so pale? For now the blood of twenty thousand men did triumph in my face, and they are fled. And till so much blood thither come again, have I not reason to look pale and dead? All souls that will be safe fly from my side, for time has set a blood upon my pride. Comfort, my liege, remember who you are. <laughs> I had forgot myself. Am I not king? Awake, thou coward majesty, thou sleepest. I am, is not the king's name, twenty thousand names? Arm, arm, my name, a puny subject strikes. At thy great glory, look not to the ground, ye favours of a king. Are we not high? High be our thoughts. I know my uncle York hath power enough to serve our turn. But who comes here? Enter Sir Stephen's group. More health and happiness betide my liege than can my care turn tongue deliver him. Mine ear is open and my heart prepared. The worst is worldly loss thou canst unfold. Say, is my kingdom lost? Why, it was my care, and what lost is to be rid of care? Strives Bolingbroke to be great as we? Greater he shall not be. If he serve God, we'll serve him too and be his fellow so. Revolt our subjects? That we cannot mend. They break their faith to God as well as to us. Cry woe, destruction, ruin, and decay. The worst is death, and death will have his day. Glad am I that your highness is so armed to bear the tidings of calamity. Like an unseasonable stormy day, which makes the silver rivers drown their shores, 
As if the world were all dissolved to tears, so high above his limits swells the rage of bowling brook, covering your fearful land with hard bright steel and hearts harder than steel. White beards have armed their thin and hairless scalps against thy majesty. Boys with women's voices strive to speak big and clap their female joints in stiff unwieldy arms against thy crown. The very beadsmen learn to bend their bows of double fatal you against thy state. Yea, distaff women manage rusty bills against thy seat. Both young and old rebel, and all goes worse that I have power to tell. Too well, too well. How tellst the tale so ill? Where is the Earl of Wiltshire? Where is Baggett? What has become of Bushy? Where is Green? That they have let the dangerous enemy measure our confines with such peaceful steps? If we prevail, their heads shall pay for it. I warrant they have made peace with Boilingbrook. Peace have they made with him indeed, my lord. Oh, villains! Vipers! Damned without redemption! Dogs easily want to fawn on any man! Snakes in my heart blood warmed that sting my heart! Three Judases, each one thrice worth than Judas. Would they make peace? Terrible hell make war upon their spotted soul for this offence. Sweet love, I see, changing his property, turns to the sourest and most deadly hate. Again, uncurse their souls, their peace is made with heads and not with hands. Those whom you curse have felt the worst of death's destroying wound and lie full low, graved in the hollow ground. Is Bushy Green and the Earl of Wiltshire dead? Aye. All of them at Bristol lost their heads. Where is the Duke my father with his power? No matter where, of comfort no man speaks. Ah, let's talk of graves. Of worms and epitaphs. Make dust our paper and with rainy eyes write sorrow on the bosom of the earth. Let's choose executors and talk of wills. And yet not so, for what can we bequeath save our deposed bodies to the ground? Our lands, our lives, and all our boiling brooks. And nothing can we call our own but death and that small model of the barren earth which serves as paste and cover to our bones. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. For some, how some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghost they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his court, and there the antics sit, scoffing his state and grinning at the pomp, allowing him a breath, a little scene, to monarchize, be feared and kill with looks, infusing him with self and vain conceit, as if this flesh which walls about our life were brass impregnable, and humour thus come at the last, and with a little pin, bores through his castle walls, and farewell king. Cover your heads, and mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence. Throw away respect, tradition, form, ceremonious duty, for you have but mistook me all this while. I live with bread, like you, feel want, taste grief, need friends. Subjected thus, how can you say to me I am a king? My lord, wise men there sit and wail, but presently prevent the ways to wail. To fear the foe, since fear oppresseth strength, gives in your weakness strength unto your foe. And so your follies fight against yourself. 
Fear and be slain, no worse can come to fight, and fight and die is death destroying death, where fearing dying pays death servile breath. My father hath a power, inquire of him, and learn to make a body of a limb. Thou chidest me well. Proud boiling brook, I come to charge blows with thee for our day of doom. This ague fit of fear is overblown. An easy task is to win our own. Say, Scroop, what lie, where lies our uncle with his power? Speak sweetly, man, although thou looks be sour. Men judge by the complexion of the sky, the state and inclination of the day. So may you, by my dull and heavy eye, my tongue hath but a heavier tale to say. I play the torturer by small and small to lengthen out the words that must be spoken. Your uncle York is joined with Bolingbroke, and all your northern castles yielded up, and all your southern gentlemen in arms upon his party. Thou hast said enough. Beshrew thee, cousin, which didn't lead me forth. To the oh, what of sweet Arnold. way was I to despair? What say you now? What comfort have we now? By heaven, I'll hate him everlastingly, that bids me be of comfort any more. Go to Flint Castle, there I'll pine away. A king, woe slave, shall kingly woe obey. That power I have, discharge and let them go, to ear the land that has some hope to grow, for I have none. Let no man speak again to alter this, for counsel is but vain. My liege, one word. He does me double wrong, the wounds me with the flatteries of his tongue. Discharge my followers, let them hence away from Richard's knights. To boiling brooks, fair day. Everybody leaves. Scene three, Wales, before Flint Castle. Enter with drum and colours, Henry Bolingbroke, Duke of York, Northumberland, attendants and forces. So that by this intelligence we learn, the Welshmen are dispersed, and Salisbury is gone to meet the king, who lightly landed with some few pirate friends upon this coast. The news is very fair and good, my lord. Richard, not, not far from hence, hath hid his head. It would beseem the Lord Northumberland to say King Richard, alack the heavy day when such a sacred king should hide his head. Your grace mistakes only to be brief, left I his title out. The time hath been. Would you have been so brief with him? He would have been so brief with you, to shorten you, for taking so the head, your whole head's length. Stake not, uncle, further than you should. Take not, good cousin, further than you should, lest you mistake the heavens are over our heads. I know it, uncle, and oppose not myself against their will. But who comes here? Enter Henry Percy Hotspur. Welcome, Harry. What? Will not this castle yield? The castle of Royally is manned, my lord, against thy entrance. Royally? Why? It contains no king? Yes, my good lord, it doth contain a king. King Richard lies within the limits of yon lime and stone, and with him are the Lord Ormel, Lord Salisbury, Sir Stephen Scroop, besides a clergyman of holy reverence who I cannot learn. Oh, belike it is the Bishop of Carlisle. Noble lords, go to the rude ribs of that ancient castle. Through brazen trumpet sends the breath of parley into his ruined ears and thus deliver. Henry Bolingbroke, on both his knees, does kiss King Richard's hand and sends allegiance and true faith of heart to his most royal person. Hither come, even at his feet, to lay my arms and power, provided that my banishment repealed and lands restored be freely granted. If not, I'll use the advantage of my power and lay the summer's dust with showers of blood 
rained from the wounds of slaughtered Englishmen. The witch, how far off from the mind of Bolingbroke it is, such crimson tempers should be French, the fresh green lap of fair King Richard's land. My stooping duty tenderly shall show. Go signify as much, while here we march upon the grassy carpet of this plain. Let's march without the noise of threatening drum. But from threatening drum, but from the castle's tattered battlements, our fair appointments may be well perused. Methinks King Richard and myself should meet with no less terror than the elements of fire and water, when their thundering shock at meeting tears the cloudy cheeks of heaven. He be the fire, I'll be the yielding water. The rage be his, whilst on earth I rain my waters, on the earth and not on him. March on, and mark King Richard how he looks. Parley without an answer within. Then a flourish. Enter on the walls King Richard II, the Bishop of Carlisle, Duke of Ormail, Sir Stephen Scroop, and Earl of Salisbury. See, see, King Richard does himself appear, as does the blushing, discontented sun from out the fiery portal of the east, when he perceives the envious clouds are bent to dim his glory and to stain the track of bright passage to, to the occident. Yet looks he like a king. Behold his eye, as bright as is the eagle's, lightens forth, controlling majesty. Alack, alack, for woe, that any harm should stain so fair a show. We are amazed, and thus long have we stood to watch the more fearful bending of thy knee. Because we thought ourselves thy lawful king, and if we be, how dare thy joints forget to pay their awful duty to our presence? If we be not, show us the hand of God that hath dismissed us from our stewardship. For well we know, no hand of blood and bone can gripe the sacred handle of our scepter, unless he do profane, steal, or usurp. And though you think that all as you have done have torn their souls by turning them from us, and we are barren and bereft of friends, Yet no, my master, God omnipotent, is mustering in his clouds on our behalf armies of pestilence, and they shall strike your children yet unborn and unbegot, that lift your vessel's hand against my head and threat the glory of my precious crown. Tell Boiling Brook, from yond me thinks he stands, that every stride he makes upon my land is dangerous treason. He has come to open the purple testament of bleeding war, but ere the crown he looks for live in peace. Ten thousand bloody crowns of mother's son shall ill become the flowers of England's face, change the complexion of her male made pale peace to scarlet indignation and bedew her pastor's grass with faithful English blood. The king of heaven forbid our lord the king should do with civil and uncivil arms be rushed upon. The thrice noble cousin, Harry Bolingbroke, doth humbly kiss thy hand, and by the honorable tomb he swears, that stands upon your royal grandsire's bones, and by the royalties of both your bloods, currents that spring for from one most gracious head, and by the buried hand of warlike gaunt, and by the worth and honor of himself, comprising all that may be sworn or said. His coming hither hath no further scope than for his lineal royalties and to beg enfranchisement immediate on his knee which on thy royal party granted once his glittering arms he will commend to rust his barbed steeds to stables and his heart to faithful service of your majesty this swears he as he is a prince is just and as i am a gentleman 
I credit him. Northumberland, say thus the king returns. His noble cousin is right welcome hither, and all the number of his fair demands shall be accomplished without contradiction. With all the gracious utterance thou hast speak to his gentle hearing kind of commands. We do debase ourselves, cousin, do we not? To look so poorly and to speak so fair. Shall we call back Northumberland and send defiance to the traitor, and so die? No, good my lord. Let's fight with gentle words, till time lend friends and friends their helpful swords. Oh god. Oh god. There this tongue of mine, that late the sentence of dread banishment on yon young proud man, should take it off again with words, words of sooth. Oh, that I were as great as my grief, or lesser than my name, that I could forget what I had been, and not remember what I must be now. Swells thou, proud heart, I'll give thee scope to beat, since foes have scope to beat thee, both thee and me. Northumberland comes back from Bolingbroke. What must the king do now? Must he submit? The king shall do it. Must he be deposed? The king shall be contented. Must he lose the name of king? For God's name, let it go. <laughs> I'll give my jewels for a set of beads. My gorgeous palace for a hermitage. My gay apparel for an armsman's gown. My figured goblets for a dish of wood, my scepter for a palmer's walking staff, my subjects for a pair of carved saints, and my large kingdom for a little grave, a little, little grave, an obscure grave, or I'll be buried in the king's highway, some way of common trade where subjects' feet may hourly trample on their sovereign's head. For mine, for on my heart they threaten our while I live. And buried once, why not upon my head? Oh, Mo, thou weepst, my tender-hearted cousin. Well, we'll make foul weather with despised tears. Our sighs and they shall lodge the summer corn and make a dearth in this revolted land. And shall we play the wanton with our woes and make some pretty march with shredding tears? As thus, to drop them still upon one place till they have fretted us a pair of graves within the earth and therein laid. There lies two kinsmen dig their graves with weeping eyes. Would not this ill do well? Well, well. I see. I talk but idly and you laugh at me. <sighs> Most mighty prince, my lord Northumberland, what says King Boilingbroke? Will his majesty give King Richard leave to live till Richard die? You make a leg and Boilingbroke says I. My lord, in the base court he doth attend to speak with you. May it please you to come down. Down. Down I come, like glistering Python, wanting the manage of unruly jades in the base court. Base court, where kings grow base, to come at traitor's call and do them grace in the base court. Come down. Down, court. Down, king. The night owls shriek when mounting larks should sing. They all leave from above. What says his majesty? Sorrow and grief of heart makes him speak fondly, like a frantic man. Yet he is come. Enter King Richard and his attendants below. Stand all apart and show fair duty to his majesty. He kneels. My gracious lord. Fair cousin, you debase your princely knee to make the base earth proud with kissing it. 
Me rather had my heart might feel your love than my unpleased eye see your curtsy. Up, cousin, up. Your heart is up, I know. Thus high at least, although, although you are me below. My gracious lord, I come but for my own. Your own is yours, and I am yours and all. So far be mine, my most redoubted lord, and my, as my true service shall deserve your love. Well, you deserve. They well deserve to have, that know the strongest and surest way to get. Uncle, give me your hands. Nay, dry your eyes. Tears show their love, but want their remedies. Cousin, I am too young to be your father, though you are old enough to be my heir. What you will have, I'll give, and willing to. For do we must what force will have us do. <clears throat> Set on towards London, cousin, is it so? E, my good lord. Then I must not say no. There is a flourish, and everybody exits. Scene four, Langley, the Duke of York's garden. Enter the Queen and two ladies. What squad? Oh, I did ice cream. Got into the. Guys, I will. Guys, I will. Madam, we shall dance. Come the garden. What sport should we devise here in this garden to drive away the heavy thought of care? Madam, we'll play at bowls. It will make me think the world is full of rubs and that my fortune rubs against the bias. Madam, we'll dance. My legs can keep no measure in delight while my poor heart no measure cre uh, keeps in grief. Therefore, no dancing, girl, some other sport. Um, madam, we'll tell tales. Of sorrow or of joy? Of either, madam. Of neither, girl, for of joy being altogether one thing, it doth remember me the more of sorrow, or if of grief being altogether had, it adds more sorrow to my want of joy, for what I have I need not to repeat, and what I want it boots not to complain. Madam, I'll sing. Tis well that thou hast cause, but thou shouldst please me better, wouldst thou weep? I could weep, madam, 
would it do you good? And I could sing, would weeping do me good, and never borrow any tear of thee. Enter a gardener and two servants. Oh, but stay, here come the gardeners. Let's step into the shadow of these trees, my wretchedness onto a row of pins. They'll talk of state, for every one doth so against a change. Woe is forerun with woe. The queen and the ladies retire. Go, bound thou up yon dangling apricocks, which, like unruly children, make their sires stoop with oppression of their prodigal weight. Give some supportance to the bending twigs. Go thou, like an executioner, cut off the heads of two fast-growing sprays that look too lofty in our commonwealth. All must be even in our government. You, thus employed, I will go root away the noisome weeds which, without profit, suck the soil's fertility from wholesome flowers. Why should we, in the compass of a pale, keep law and form and due proportion, showing, as in a model, our firm estate, when our sea-walled garden, the whole land, is full of weeds, her fairest flowers choked up, her fruit trees all upturned, her edges ruined, her knots disordered, and her wholesome herbs swarming with caterpillars? Hold thy peace! He that hath suffered this disordered spring hath now himself met with the fall of leaf. The words with his broad spreading leaves did shelter that seemed in eating him to hold him up, and plucked up root and all by Bolingbroke, I mean the Earl of Wiltshire, Bushy Green. Ah, are they dead? They are, and Bolingbroke hath seized the, wa seized the wasteful king. Oh, what a pity it is that he hath not trimmed and dressed his land as we this garden. We, at time of year, do wound the bark and the skin of our fruit trees, lest being overproud in sap and blood, with too much riches it confound itself. He hath done so to great and growing men. They might have lived to bear, and he to taste their fruits of duty, superfluous branches. We lop away, that bearing boughs may live. He had done so, himself had borne the crown, which waste of idle hours hath quite thrown down. Think you then the king shall be deposed? Depressed he is already, and deposed, tis doubt he will be. Letters came last night to a dear friend of the good Duke of York's that tell black tidings. Oh, I am pressed to death through want of speaking. Thou old Adam's likeness set to dress this garden, how dares thy harsh rude tongue sound this unpleasing news? What eaves what serpent hath suggested thee to make a second fall of cursed man? Why dost thou say King Richard is deposed? Darest thou, thou little better thing than earth, divine his downfall? Say where, when, and how? Camest thou by this ill tidings? Speak, thou wretch. Pardon me, madam. Little joy have I to breathe this news. Yet what I say is true. King Richard... He is the mighty hold of Bolingbroke, their fortunes both are weighed, in your lord's scale is nothing but himself, and some few vanities that make him light, but in the balance of great Bolingbroke, besides himself, are all the English peers, and with that odds he weighs King Richard down. Post you to London, and you will find it so, I speak no more than every one doth know. Nimble mischance that art so light of foot doth not thy Embassage belong to me, and what am I? And am I last that knows it? I think that, oh, thou thinks to serve me last that I may longest keep thy sorrow in my breast. Come, ladies, go to go to meet at London, London, London's king in woe. What was I born to this that my sad look should grace the triumph of great Bolingbroke, gardener, for telling me these news of woe? Pray God the plants thou grafts may never grow. The queen and the ladies all leave. Poor queen. So that thy state might be no worse, I would my skill were subject to thy curse. Here did she fall a tear. Here in this place I'll set a bank of rue, sour herb of grace. Rue, even for Ruth, here shortly shall be seen in the remembrance of a weeping queen. And everybody leaves. Act 4, Scene 1, Westminster Hall. Enter as to the Parliament, Henry Bolingbroke, Duke of Ormel, Northumberland, Henry Percy.
Hotspur, Lord Fitzwater, Duke of Surrey, the Bishop of Carlisle, the Abbot of Westminster, and another Lord, Herald, Officers, and Faggot. All for Faggot. Now, Baggot, freely speak thy mind. What thou dost know of noble Gloucester's death? Who wrought it with the king, and who performs the bloody office of his timeless end? Then set before my face the Lord Armeril. Cousin, stand forth and look upon that man. My Lord Armeril, I know your daring tongue scorns to unsay what once hath delivered. In that time, in that dead time when Gloucester's death was plotted, I heard you say, is not my arm of length that reacheth from the restful English court as far as Calais to mine uncle's head? Amongst much other talk, that very time I heard you say that you had rather refused the offer of an hundred thousand crowns than born to return to England, adding with all how blessed this land would be in this your cousin's death. Princes and noble lords, what answer shall I make to this base man? Shall I so much dishonour my fair stars on, awkward, on equal terms to give him chastisement? Either I must, or have mine honour soiled with the attainder of his slanderous lips. There is my gauge, the manual seal of death, that marks thee out for hell. I say thou liest, and will maintain what thou hast said is false in, my, in thy heart blood, though being all too base to stain the temper of ni my knightly sword. Agut, forbear, thou shalt not take it up. Excepting one, I would he were the best in all the presence in all this presence that hath moved me to uh, have moved me so. If thy that valour stand on sympathy, here is my gauge, O Merle, is gauge to thine. If that fair son which shows me where thou standst, I heard thee say, and vauntingly thou spakest it, that thou wert cause of noble Gloucester's death. If thou deniest twenty times, thou liest, and I will turn thy falsehood to thy heart were it forged with my rapier's point. Thou darest not, coward, live to see that day. Now, by my soul, I would it were this hour. Fitzwater, thou art damned to hell for this. Oh, Merle, thou liest. His honour is as true in this appeal as thou art all unjust. And that thou art so, there I throw my gauge. To prove it on thee to the extremest point of mortal grieving, seize it, if thou darest. And if I do not, may my hands rot off and never brandish more revengeful steel over the glittering helmet of my foe. I task the earth to the like, for sworn or merle, and spur thee on with full as many lies as may be hollered in thy treacherous ear from sun to sun. There is my honour's pawn. Engage it to the trial, if thou darest. Oh, who sets me else? By heaven I'll throw it all. I have a thousand spirits in one breast to answer twenty thousand such as you. My lord Fitzwater, I do remember well the very time on Merlin you did talk. Tis very true. You were in presence then, and you can witness with me this is true. As false by heaven as heaven itself is true. Sorry, thou liest. Dishonourable boy. That lie shall lie so heavy on my sword that it shall render vengeance and revenge. Till thou, the lie-giver, and that lie do lie in earth as quiet as thy father's skull. In proof whereof there is my honour's pawn, engage it to the trial if thou darest. How fondly dost thou spur a forward horse! If I dare eat, or drink, or breathe, or live, I dare meet Surrey in a wilderness and spit upon him, whilst I say he lies and lies and lies. There is my bond of faith to tie thee to my strong correction, as I intended to thrive in this new world. O Merle is guilty of my true appeal. Besides, I heard the banished Norfolk say that thou, O Merle, didst send two of thy men to execute the noble duke at Calais. Some honest, Christ some honest Christian trust me with a gauge that Norfolk lies. Here do I throw down this, if he may be repealed to try his honour. These differences shall all rest on the gauge, till Norfolk be repealed. Repealed he shall be, and though mine enemy restored again to all his lands and signories, when he's returned, against all Mel Merle we will enforce his trial. That honourable day shall ne'er be seen. Many a time hath banished Norfolk fought for Jesu Christ in glorious Christian field, streaming the ensign of the Christian cross against black pagans, Turks, and Saracens, and toiled with works of war. 
retired himself to Italy, and there at Venice gave his body to that pleasant country's earth, and his pure soul unto his captain, Christ, under whose colours he had fought for so long. I, Bishop, is Norfolk dead? Surely as I live, my lord. Sweet peace conduct his sweet soul to the bosom of good old Abraham. Your differences shall all rest under gauge till we assign you to your days of trial. Enter the Duke of York, attended. Great Duke of Lancaster, I come to thee from plucked Richard, who with willing soul adopts thee heir, and his high scepter yields to the possession of thy royal hand. Ascend his throne, descending now from him, and long live Henry, fourth of that name. God's name, I'll ascend the regal throne. Mary, God forbid! Worst in this royal presence may I speak, yet best beseeming me to speak the truth. Would God that any in this noble presence were enough noble to be the upright judge of noble Richard? Then true noblesse would learn in forbearance from so foul a wrong. What subject can give sentence on his king? And who sits here that is not Richard's subject? Thieves are not judged, but they are by to hear, although apparent guilt be seen in them, and shall the figure of God's majesty, his captain, steward, deputy elect, anointed, crowned, planted many years, be judged by subject and inferior breath, and he himself not ple present? Oh, for offended God, that in a Christian climate souls refined should show so heinous, black, obscene a deed. I speak to subjects, and a subject speaks, stirred up by God thus boldly for his king. My lord of Ereford here, whom you call king, is a foul traitor to proud Ereford's king, and if you crown him, let me prophesy, the blood of English shall manure the ground, and future ages groan for this foul act. Peace shall go sleep with Turks and infidels, and in this seat of peace tumultuous wars shall kin with kin and kind with kind confound. Disorder, horror, fear, and mutiny shall here inhabit, and this land be called the field of Golgotha and dead men's skulls. Oh, if you raise this house against this house, it will the woefulest division prove that ever fell upon this cursed earth. Prevent it, resist it, let it not be so, lest child, child, children cry against you woe. Well have you argued, sir, and for your pains of capital treason re rescue here, my lord of Westminster, be it your charge to keep him safely till his day of trial. May it please you, lords, to grant the commons suit. Hibber Richard, that in common view he may surrender, so we shall proceed without suspicion. I will be his conduct, and the Duke of York exits. Lords, you that are here are under our arrest. Procure your sureties for your days of answer. Little are we beholding to your love, and little looked for at your helping hands. The Duke of York re-enters with King Richard II and officers bearing the regalia. And that? Why am I sent for to the king? Before I have shook off the regal thoughts wherein I had resigned, reigned? I hardly yet have learned to insinuate, flatter, bow, and bend my limbs. Give sorrow, leave a while to two to me to this submission. Yet I well remember the favour of these men. Were they not mine? Did they not sometimes cry, hail all, all hail, to me? So Judas did to Christ. But he in twelve found truth in all but one. I, in twelve thousand, none. God save the king! Will no man say amen? Am I both priest and clerk? Well then, amen. God save the king! Although I be not him, and yet our men, if heaven do think him me, <sighs> to what, to do what service am I sent for hither? 
to do that office of thine own good will, which tired majesty did make the offer, the resignation of thy state and crown to Henry Bolingbroke. Give me the crown. Here, cousin. Seize the crown. Here, cousin. On this side my hand, on that side yours. Now is this golden crown like a deep well that owes two buckets filling one another, the emptier ever dancing in the air, the other down, unseen and full of water. That bucket down and full of tears am I, drinking my griefs whilst you mount up on high. I thought you had been willing to resign. My crown I am, but still my griefs are mine. You may my glories and my state depose, but not my griefs. Still am I king of those. Part of your cares you give me with your crown. Your cares set up does not pluck my cares down. My care is loss of care by old care done. Your care is gain of care by new care won. The cares I give I have, though given away. They tend the crown, yet still with me they stay. Are you consented to resign the crown? I. No. No, I. For... I must nothing be. Therefore, no, 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 for I resign to thee. Now mark me how I will undo myself. I give this heavy weight from off my head and this unwieldy scepter from my hand. The kingly, the pride of kingly sway from out my heart. With mine own tears, I wash away my balm. With mine own hands, I give away my crown. With mine own tongue, deny my sacred state. With mine own breath, release all duties rights. All pomp and majesty I do forswear. My manners, rents, revenues I forego. My acts, decrees and statutes I deny. God pardon all oaths that are broke to me. God keep all vows unbroke that swear to thee. Make me what nothing have with nothing grieved, and thou with all pleased that hath all achieved. Long mayst thou live in richest seat to sit, and soon lie rigid in an earthly pit. God save King Harry, on King Richard says, and sent him many years of sunshine days. <sighs> what more remains? No more, but that you read these accusations and these grievous crimes committed by your person and your followers against the state and prophet of this land that by confessing them, the souls of men may deem that you are worthily disposed. Must I do so? And must I revel out my weed, God folly? Gentle Northumberland, if thy offences were upon record, would it not shame thee in so fair troop to read a lecture of them? If thou wouldst, there shouldst thou find one heinous article containing the deposing of a king and cracking the strong, strong warrant of an oath, marked with a blot, damned in the book of heaven. Nay, all of you that stand and look upon, whilst death my wretchedness doth bait myself, thou, some of you, though some of you with Pilate wash your hands, showing an outward pity, yet you Pilots have here delivered me to my sour cross, and water cannot wash away your sin. My lord, dispatch, read o'er these articles. Mine eyes are full of tears I cannot see, and yet salt water blinds them not so much, but they can see a sort of traitors here. Nay, 
If I turn mine eyes upon myself, I find myself a traitor with the rest. For I have given here my soul's consent to undeck the pompous body of a king. Made glory base and sovereignty a slave. Proud majesty a subject, state a peasant. My lord. No lord of thine, thou hast insulted man. Nor, no man's lord, I have no name, no title. No, not that name has, was given me at the front. For tis usurped, lack the heavy day, that I have worn so many winters out, and know not now what name to call myself. Oh, that I was a mockery king of snow, standing before the sun of boiling brook, to melt myself away in water drops. Good king, great king, and yet not greatly good. And if my word be sterling yet in England, let it command a mirror hither straight that I may show me what a face I have, since it is bankrupt of his majesty. Oh, some of you, and fetch a looking glass. One of the attendants leave. Read o'er this paper while the glass doth come. Fiend, thou torment me, I come to hell. I do no more, my lord Northumberland. The commons will not then be satisfied. They shall be satisfied. I'll read enough, when I do see the very book indeed where all my sins are writ, and that's myself. An attendant re-enters with a glass. Give me the glass, and then will I read. Ha! Huh. No deeper wrinkles yet. Has sorrow struck so many blows upon this face of mine, and made no deeper wounds? A flattering, oh flattering glass. Like to my followers in prosperity, thou doth beguile me. Was this face the face that every day under his household roof did keep ten thousand men? Was this the face that, like the sun, did make beholders wink? Was this the face that faced so many follies, and was at last outfaced by boiling brook? A brittle glory shines in this face. As brittle as the glory in the face. He dashes the glass against the ground. For there it is, cracked in a hundred shivers. Mark, silent king, the support of the moral of this sport. How soon my sorrow hath destroyed my face. The shadow of your sorrow hath destroyed the shadow of your face. Say that again. The shadow of my sorrow. Ah, huh. let's see. It is very true. My grief lies all within. And these external manners of lament are merely shadows to the unseen grief that swells with silence in the tortured soul. There lies the substance. And I thank thee, King, King for thy great bounty that not only givest me cause to wail, but teaches me the way how to lament the cause. I'll beg one boon, and then I'll and then be gone and trouble you no more. Shall I obtain it? Name it, fair cousin. Fair cousin, I am greater than a king. For when I was a king, my flatterers were then but subjects. Being now a subject, I am a king. I have a king here to my flatterer. Being so great, I have no need to beg. Yet ask. And shall I have? Shall. And give me leave to go. Whither? Whither you will. For I, so I were from your sight. Oh, some of you convey him to the tower. Oh, good. Convey. Convey us are you all that rise thus nimbly by a true king's fall. King Richard the Second leaves with some lords and a guard. Wednesday next, we solemnly set down our coronation. Lords, prepare yourselves. Everybody leaves except the Bishop of Carlisle, the Abbot of Westminster, and Duke of Armel. A woeful pa 
Payton have we here beheld? The woes to come, the children yet unborn, shall feel this day as sharp to them as thorn. You holy clergyman, is there no plot to rid the realm of this pernicious plot? My lord, before I speak freely, I freely speak my mind herein, you shall not only take the sacrament to bury mine intent, but also to effect whatever I shall happen to devise. I see your brows are full of discontent, your hearts of sorrow and your eyes of tears. Come home with me to supper, and I'll lay the plot shall show us all a merry day. And everybody leaves. And we are going to take a quick 10 minute break so that the actors can all go get some water and the viewers can also go get some water.
Welcome back to Act 5, Scene 1. London, a street leading to the tower. Enter the Queen and Ladies. This way the king will come. This is the way to Julius Caesar's erected tower, to whose flint bosom my condemned lord is doomed a prisoner by proud bowling broke. Here let us rest, if this rebellious earth have any resting for her true king's queen. Enter King Richard the Second and a guard. Oh, but soft, you, but soft, but see, or rather, do not see my fair rose wither. Yet look up, behold, that you and many, that you and pity may dissolve to dew and wash him fresh again with true love tears. Ah, thou the model where old Troy did stand, thou map of honour, thou kitch of King Richard's tomb, and not King Richard, thou most beauteous in. Why should hard favoured grief be lodged in thee when triumph is become an alehouse guest? Join me love with grief, fair woman. Do not so, to make my end too sudden. Learn, good soul, to think our former state a happy dream, from which awaked the truth of what we are shows us but this. I am a sworn brother, sweet to grim necessity, and he and I will keep a league till death. Hide thee to France, and cloister thee in some religious house. Our holy lives must win a new world's crown, which our profane hours here has stricken down. What, is my Richard both in shape and mind transformed and weakened? Hath Bolingbroke deposed thine intellect? Hath he been in thy heart? The lion dying thrusteth forth his paw and wounds the earth, if nothing else with rage, to be overpowered, or, and wilt thou, pupil-like, take thy correction mildly, kiss the rod, and fawn on rage with base humility, which art a lion and a king of beasts? A king of beasts, indeed. If aught but beast, I had been still a happy king of men. Good sometime, queen. Prepare thee for, hence for France. Think I am dead. And that even here thou takest from as from my deathbed, thy last living leave. In winter's tedious night, sit by the fire with good old folks, and tell them, uh, and let them tell thee tales of woeful ages long ago betid. And ere thou bid good night to quit these grief, their griefs, tell thou the lamentable tale of me, and send the hearers weeping to their beds. For why the sense brand will sympathize the heavy accent of thy moving tongue, and in compassion weep the fire out, and some will mourn in ashes, some coal black, and the deposing of a rightful king. Enter Northumberland and others. My lord, the mind of Bolingbroke has changed. You must to pomp threat not unto the tower and map. There is order taken for you. With all swift speed you must away to France. Northumberland, thou ladder, where withal the mounting boiling brook ascends my throne, the time shall not be many hours of age. More than it is a foul sin, a foul sin gathering head shall break into corruption. Thou shalt think, though he divide the realm and give thee half, it is too little helping him to all. And he shall think that thou, which knowest the way to plant unrightful kings, will no, know again, being ne'er so little urged, another way to pluck him headlong from the usurped throne. The love of wicked men converts to fear, that fear to hate, and hate turns one or both to worthy danger and deserved death. My guilt be on my head, and there an end, take leave and part, for you must part forthwith. Double, doubly divorced, bad men, you violate a twofold marriage twixt my crown and me, and then twixt me and my married wife. Let me unkiss the oath twixt thee and me. Forget not so, for with a kiss was made. Part us, Northumberland, I towards the north, where shivering cold and sickness pines the climb. My wife to France. For when set forth in pomp, she came adorned hither like sweet May, sent back like Hallowmas, or shortest of day. And must we be divided? Must we part? Aye, hand from hand, my love, and heart from heart. Banish us both and send the king with me. That were some love but little policy. Then whither he goes, thither let me go. So two together weepst, make one woe. Weep thou for me in France, I for thee here. Better far off than near, be near, be near, never than near. 
Go, count thy way with sighs, I mine with groans. So longest way shall have the longest moans. Twice with one step I'll groan, the way being short, and pierce the way without with a heavy heart. Come, come, in one sorrow let be brief, since wetting it there is such length in grief. One kiss shall stop our mouths and dumbly part. Thus give I mine, and thus take I thy heart. Give me mine own again, to no good part to take on me and keep, thy, keep and kill thy heart. So now I have mine own again, be gone, that I might strive to kill it with a groan. We make woe wanton with this fond delay. Once more adieu, the rest let sorrow say. And everybody leaves. Scene two. The Duke of York's palace. Enter Duke of York and Duchess of York. My lord, you told me you would tell the rest, when weeping made you break the story off, of our two cousins coming into London. Where did I leave? At that sad stop, my lord, where rude misgoverned hands from windows tops threw dust and rubbish on King Richard's head. Then, as I said, the Duke, great Bolingbroke, mounted upon a hot and fiery steed, which his aspiring rider seemed to know, with slow but stately pace kept on his course, whilst all tongues cried, God save thee, Bolingbroke. You would have thought the very window spake, so many greedy looks of young and old, through casements darted their desiring eyes upon his visage, and that all the walls with painted imagery had said at once, Jesus serve thee, welcome, Bolingbroke, whilst he, from the one side to the other turning, bareheaded lower than his proud steed's neck, bespake them thus, I thank you, countrymen, and thus still doing, thus he passed along. Alack, poor Richard, where rode he the whilst? As in a theatre, the eyes of men after a whale-graced actor leaves the stage are idly bent on him that enters next, thinking his prattle to be tedious. Even so, or with much more contempt, men's eyes did scowl on gentle Richard. No man cried, God save him. No joyful tongue gave him his welcome home. But dust was thrown upon his sacred head, which with such gentle sorrow he shook off. His face still combating with tears and smiles, the batches of his grief and patience. That had not God for some strong purpose steal the hearts of men, they must perforce have melted, and barbarism itself have pitied him. But heaven hath a hand in these events, to whose high will we bound our calm contents. To Bolingbroke are we sworn subjects now, whose state and honour I for I allow. Here comes my son, Omeril. Omeril, that was. But that is lost for being Richard's friend. And madam, you must call him Rutland now. I am in Parliament pledge for his truth and lasting fealty to the new-made king. The Duke of Omeril enters. Welcome, my son. Who are the violets now that strew the green lap of the new-come spring? Oh, madam, I know not, nor I greatly care not. God knows I had his leaf be none as one. Well, bear you well in this new spring of time, lest you be cocked before you come to prime. What news from Oxford? For those Judson times? For aught I know, my lord, they do. You will be there, I know. If God prevent not, I purpose so. What seal is that, that hangs without thy bosom? Yea, lookest thou pale? Let me see the writing. My lord, tis nothing. No matter then who see it, I will be satisfied, let me see the writing. I do beseech your grace to pardon me, it is a matter of small consequence, for which for some reasons I would not have seen. Which for some reasons, sir, I mean to see. I fear, I fear. What, what should, should you fear? fear? Oh. Tis nothing but some bond that he has entered into, for gay apparel against the triumph day. Bound to himself? What doth he with a bond that he is bound to? Wife, thou art a fool. Boy, let me see the writing. I do beseech you, pardon me, I may not show it. 
I will be satisfied. Let me see it, I say. He plucks it out of his bosom and reads it. Treason, foul treason, villain, traitor, slave! What is the matter, my lord? Oh, who is within here? A servant entered. Saddle my horse. God for his mercy, what treachery is here? Why, what is it, my lord? Give me my boots. I say, saddle my horse now by mine honor, by my life, by my troth. I will impeach the villain. What is the matter? Peace, foolish woman. I will not peace. What is the matter, O Merle? Good mother, be content. It is no more than my poor life must answer. My life answer? Bring me my boots. I will enter the king. The servant re-enters with the boots. Strike him, O Merle. Poor boy, thou art amazed. Hence, villain, never more come in my sight. Give me my boots, I say. Why, York, what wilt thou do? Wilt thou not hide the trespass of thine own? Have we more sons? Or are we like to have? Is not my teeming date drunk up with time? And wilt thou pluck my fair son from mine age, and rob me of a happy mother's name? Is he not like thee? Is he not thine own? Thou fond madwoman, wilt thou conceal this dark conspiracy? A dozen of them here have taken the sacrament and interchangeably set down their hands to kill the king at Oxford. He shall be none. We'll keep him here. And then what is that to him? Away, fond woman. Were he twenty times my son, I would appeach him. Hadst thou groaned for him as I have done, thou wouldst be more pitiful. But now I know thy mind. Thou dost suspect that I have been disloyal to thy bed, and that he is a bastard, not thy son. Sweet York, sweet husband, be not of that mind. He is as like thee as a man may be, not like to me, or any of my kin, and yet I love him. Make way, unruly woman. The Duke of York exits. After, O'Merrill, mount thee upon his horse, spur post, and get before him to the king. And beg thy pardon, ere he do accuse thee. I'll not be long behind. Though I be old, I doubt not but to ride as fast as York. And never will I rise up from the ground till Bolingbroke have pardoned thee. Away, be gone. And everybody exits. Scene three, a royal palace. Enter Henry Bolingbroke, Henry Percy Hotspur and other laws. Can no man tell me of my unthrifty son? Tis full three months since I did see him last. If any plague hang over us, tis he. I would to God, my lords, he might be found. Inquire at London, amongst the taverns there. For there he say, they say he daily doth frequent with unrestrained loose companions. Even such, they say, as stand in narrow lanes and beat our watch and rob our passengers, which he, young wanton and effeminate boy, takes on the point of honour to support so dissolute a crew. My lord, some two days since I saw the prince and told him of those triumphs held at Oxford. And what said the gallant? His answer was, he would unto the stews, and from the commonest creature pluck a glove, and wear it as a favour, and with that he would unhorse the lustiest challenger. As dissolute as desperate. Yet through both I see some sparks of better hope, which elder years may happily bring forth. But who comes here? Enter the Duke of Ormel. Where is the king? What means our cousin that he stares and looks so wildly? God save your grace, I do beseech your majesty to have some conference with your grace's grace alone. Withdraw yourselves and leave us here alone. Uh, exit Henry Percy Hotspur and the Lords. What is the matter with our cousin now? Forever may my knees grow to the earth, my tongue cleave to my roof within my mouth, unless a pardon ere I rise or speak. Intended or committed was this fault, if on the first, how heinous ere it be, to win thy afterlove, I pardon thee. Then give me leave that I may turn a key that no man enter till my tale be done. Have thy desire. 
My leash, beware. Look to thyself, thou hast a traitor in thy presence there. Dylan, I'll make thee safe. He draws his sword. Stay thy revengeful hand, thou hast no cause to fear. Cause to fear. Open the door, secure, foolhardy king. Shall I for love speak treason to thy face? Open the door, or I will break it down. And the Duke of York enters. What is the matter, uncle? Speak. Recover breath. Tell us how near is danger that we may arm us to encounter it. Peruse this writing here, and thou shalt know the treason that my haste forbids me to show. Remember, as thou reads thy promise past, I do repent me. Read not my name there. My heart is not confederate with my hand. It was, villain. Ere thy hand did set it down, I tore it from the traitor's bosom, king. Fear, and not love, begets his penitence. Forget to pity him, lest thy pity prove a serpent that will sting thee to the heart. O oh, heinous, strong, and bold conspiracy! O oh, loyal father of a treacherous son! Thou sheer, immaculate, and silver fountain from when this stream through muddy passages hath held his current and defiled himself! Thy overflow of good converts to bad, and thy abundant goodness shall excuse this deadly blot in thy digressing son. So shall my virtue be his vices board, and he shall spend my, mine honour with his shame. As thriftless sons this scraping father's gold, mine honour lives when his dishonour dies, or my shamed life in his dishonour lies. Thou killest me in this life, giving him breath. The traitor lives, the true man's put to death. What ho, oh, my liege? For God's sake, let me in. What shrill voice supplicant makes this e eager cry? A woman, and thy aunt, great king, tis I. Speak with me, pity me, open the door. A beggar begs that never begged before. Our scene is altered from a serious thing, and now change to the beggar and the king. My dangerous cousin, let your mother in. I know she has come to pray for your foul sin. If thou do pardon whosoever pray, more sins for this forgiveness prosper may. This festered joint cut off, and the rest sound. This let alone will all the rest confound. The Duchess of York enters. O oh, king, believe not this hard-hearted man. Love, loving not itself, none other can. Thou frantic woman, what dost thou make here? Shall thy old dogs once more a traitor rear? Sweet York, be patient. Hear me, gentle liege. She kneels. Rise up, good aunt. Not yet, I thee beseech. Forever will I walk upon my knees, and never see the day that the happy sees, till thou give joy, until thou bid me joy, by pardoning Rutland, my transgressing boy. Unto my mother's prayers I bend my knee. Against them both my true joy spended be. Or oh, mayst thou thrive if thou grant any grace. Pleads he in earnest, look upon his face. His eyes do drop no tears, his prayers are in jest, his words come from his mouth, ours from our breast. He prays but faintly and would be denied. We pray with heart and soul and all beside. His weary joints would gladly rise, I know. Our knees shall kneel till to the ground they grow. His prayers are full of false hypocrisy, ours of true zeal and deep integrity. Our prayers do outpray his. Then let them have that mercy which true prayer ought to have. Good aunt, stand up. Nay, do not say stand up. Say pardon first and afterwards stand up and if i were thy nurse thy tongue to teach pardon should be the first word of thy speech 
I never longed to hear a word till now. Say pardon, king. Let pity teach thee how. The word is short, but not so short as sweet. No word like pardon for king's mouth so meet. Speak it in French, king. Say, pardon-moi. Dost thou teach pardon, pardon to destroy? Ah, my sour husband, my hard-hearted lord, that sets the word itself against the word. Speak pardon, as tis current in our land. The chopping French we do not understand. Thine eye begins to speak. Set thy tongue there, or in thy piteous heart plant thou thine ear. That hearing how our plaints and prayers do pierce, pity may move thee pardon to rehearse. Don't stand up. I do not sue to stand. Pardon is all the suit I have in hand. I pardon him, as God shall pardon me. Oh, happy vantage for a kneeling knee. Yet am I sick for fear. Speak it again, but twice saying pardon doth not pardon twain, but makes one pardon strong. With all my heart, I pardon him. A God on earth thou art. For our trusty brother-in-law, and the abbot, with all the rest of that consorted crew, destruction straight shall dog them at the heels. Good uncle, help to order several powers to Oxford, or where'er these traitors are. They shall not live within this world, I swear. But I will have them, if once I know where. Uncle, farewell. And cousin too, adieu. Your mother hath prayed well, and prove you true. Come, my old son. I pray God make thee new. And everybody leaves. Scene six. Same. Enter Exton and scene four, the same. Enter Exton and servant. Didst thou, didst thou not mark the king? What words he spake? Have I no friend will rid me of this living fear? Was it not so? Uh, these were his very words. I have no friend, quoth he. He spake it twice, and urged it twice together, did he not? And speaking it, he wistly looked on me. And who should say, I would thou wert the man that would divorce his terror from my heart, meaning the king at Pomfret? Come, let's go. I'm the king's friend, and we'll rid his bow. Everybody leaves. Scene five, Pomfret Castle. Enter King Richard. I've been studying. How I may compare this prison where I live unto the world. And for because the world is populous, and here is not a creature but myself, I cannot do it. Yet I'll hammer it out. My brain, I'll prove the female to my soul, my soul the father, and these two beget a generation of still breeding thoughts. And these same thoughts people this little world in humours. Like the people of this world, for no thought is contented. A better sort, as thoughts of things divine, are intermixed with scribbles and do set the world itself against the word. As thus, come, little ones, and then again, it is as hard to come as for a camel to thread the postern of a small needle's eye. Thoughts tending to ambition. They do plot unlikely wonders, how these vain, weak nails may tear a passage through the flinty rips of this hard world, my ragged prison walls. And for they cannot die in their own pride, thoughts tending to content, 
flatter themselves, for they are not the first of fortune slaves, nor shall they be the, nor shall not be the last, like silly beggars, who sitting in the stocks refuse their shame. The many have, and other must sit there, and in this thought, they kind of they find a kind of ease, bearing their own misfortunes on the back of such as have been endured, like. Thus play I, in one person, many people, and none contented. Sometimes am I king. Then treason makes me wish myself a beggar, and so I am. Then crushing penury persuades me I was better when a king. Then am I kinged again, and by and by think that I am unkinged by boiling brook. And straight am nothing. But whatever I be. Nor I know any man that but man is. With nothing shall be pleased till he be eased with being nothing. Music? Do I hear? Ha, ha. Keep time. How sour sweet music is. When time is broken, no proportion kept. So it is in the music of men's lives. And here have I the daintiness of ear to take time broke in a disordered string. But for the concord of my taste and time had not an ear to hear my true time broke. I wasted time. Now doth time waste me. For now hath time made me his numbering clock. My thoughts are minutes, and with sighs they jar. Their watches on unto my eyes, the outward watch, where to my finger like a dial's point, is pointing still, and cleansing them from tears. Now, sir, the sound that tells what hour it is are clamorous groans which strikes upon my heart, which is the bell so sighs and tears and groans show minutes, times and hours. But my time runs posting on in Boiling's Brook's proud joy. While I stand fooling here, his jagger the clock. This music mads me. Let it sound no more. For though it has hoops madmen to their wits, in me it seems it will make wise men mad. Yet, blessing on his heart that gives it me. That is a sign of love, and love to Richard is a strange brooch in this all hailing world. Enter a groom of the stable. Hail, royal prince. Thanks, noble peer. The cheapest of us is ten groats too dear. What art thou? And how comest thou hither? Where no man never comes but that sad dog that brings me food to keep misfortune live. I was a poor groom of thy stable king, when thou were king, who, travelling towards York, with much ado, at length have gotten leave to look upon my sometimes royal master's face. Oh, how it yearned my heart when I beheld in London streets that coronation day when Bolingbroke rode on Rowan Barbary. That horse that thou doth often hast bestride, that horse that I so carefully have dressed. He rode on Barbary? Tell me, gentle friend, how went he under him? So proudly, as if he disdained the ground. So proud that boiling brook was on his back, that Jave had eat bread from my royal hand. This hand hath made him proud with clapping him. Would he not stumble? Would he not fall down, since pride must have a fall and break the neck of that proud man that did usurp his back? Forgiveness, horse. Why do I rail on thee, since thou, created to be awed by man, was born to bear? I was not made a horse, and yet a bear burdened like an ass. Spurred, galled, and tired by jouncing, brawling brook. Enter a keeper with a dish. 
Hello, good place. Here is no longer stay. If thou love me, tis time thou wailed away. What my tongue dares not, that my heart shall say. And the groom leaves. My lord, will it please you to falter? Tis of it first as thou art wont to do. My lord, I dare not. To the peers of Exton, who lately came from the king, commands the country. The devil take Henry of Lancaster and the pensions and stale, and I am weary of it. He beats the keeper. Help! 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 Enter Exton and servant, armed. How now? What means death in this rude assault? Villain, thine own hand yields thy death's instrument. Snatching an axe from a servant and killing him. Go thou and fill another room in hell. He kills another, then Exton strikes him down. That hand shall burn in never quenching fire. That staggers thus my person. Exton, thy fierce hand has with the king's blood stained the king's own land. Mount, mount my soul. Thy seat is up on high. While my gross flesh sinks downward, here to die. And he dies. As full of valour as of royal blood. Both have I spilled. Good. For now, the devil that had told me I did well says that this deed is chronicled in hell. This dead king, to the living king I'll bear. Take hence the rest, and give them burial there. And everybody leaves. Scene six, Windsor Castle. Flourish. Enter Henry Bolingbroke, Duke of York, with other lords and attendants. Kind Uncle York. The latest news we hear is that the rebels have consumed with fire our town of Sirencester in Gloucestershire. But whether they be tain or slain, we hear not. Enter Northumberland. Welcome, my lord. What is the news? First, to thy sacred state wish I all happiness. The next news is I have to London sent the heads of Oxford, Salisbury, Blunt, and Kent. The manner of their taking may appear at large discoursed in this paper here. We thank thee, gentle Percy, for thy pains, and to thy worth will add right worthy gains. Enter Lord Fitzwater. My lord, I have from Oxford sent to London the heads of Brockus and Sir Bennet Seeley, two of the dangerous consorted traitors that sought at Oxford thy dire overthrow. Pains, Fitzwater, shall not be forgot. Right noble is thy merit, well I wot. Enter Henry Percy Hotspur and the Bishop of Carlisle. The grand conspirator, abbot of Westminster, the clog of conscience and sour melancholy, hath yielded up his body to the grave. But here is Carlisle, living to abide thy kingly doom and sentence of his pride. Carlyle, this is your doom. Choose out some secret place, some reverend room, more than thou hast, and with it joy thy life. So as thou livest, in peace die free from strife. For though mine enemy thou hast ever been, high sparks of honour in thee have I seen. Enter Exton, with persons bearing a coffin. Great King, within this coffin I present thy buried fear. Herein all breathless lies the mightiest of thy great enemies, Richard of Bordeaux, by me hither brought. Exton, I thank thee not. For thou hast wrought a deed of slander with thy fatal hand upon my head and all this famous land. Mouth, my lord, I, I did this deed. They love not poison that do poison need. 
Nor do I be. Though I did wish him dead. I hate the murderer. Love him murdered. The guilt of conscience take thou for thy labour. And word nor princely favour. With Cain go wander through the shades of night, and never show thy head by day nor night. Lord, I protest, my soul is full of woe, that blood should sprinkle me to make me grow. Come, mourn with me for that I do lament and puts on sullen black incontinent make a voyage to the holy land to wash this blood off from my guilty hand to grace my mornings here in weeping after this untimely beer And everybody exits. And that's curtains. The end. We did it! Yay! Yay! We, we did, did the thing! Wow. We did the thing! What a play! Amazing oh, play. play. <laughs> I absolutely oh, love it. You um, are right to. That was excellent. Yeah. I have only seen it once. And the characters were played by puppets, and it was goddamn amazing. <laughs> that sounds like the best, though. That it's is amazing. fantastic. Uh, but yeah, no. <laughs> what a play. Wow, so yeah. <sighs> yeah. Thank you so much for, for watching and listening, everyone. Yes. Yeah, thank you, thank you so very you. much. Let's that was do some. Fun. Yeah, let's do some quick fun. introductions. Chosen yeah, 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 so I'm going to go down the cast list of dreams. So we're going to start with Cillian. With me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, hi. I played Richard. Uh, and uh, you can find me in... Uh, I've, I stream over at Vanaheim Games, which I'll just uh, post. Put that in the chat. In the chat. Uh, I stream every uh, Sunday and Thursday at the moment. And I stream RPGs. So if you like that stuff, uh, I spelled it wrong. It was an E because of course. <laughs> uh, if you like that stuff, come join. It's chill. We have a good little community. And uh, yeah, that's what I do besides apparently dying horribly in yeah. a prison sometimes. But very dramatically. You played it well. Very dramatically. And be yes, you yourself do. in general. Sometimes you just need to be yourself, you know? Yeah. Yes, you do. Yeah. yeah. It's a next up, right. So next up is Sarah. Hello, uh, I'm Sarah. I played Henry the Fourth, part Richard the Second. I told you I was going to make the same joke in every stream, and I did. Uh, I also played Exton, uh, the servant, and most importantly, another lord, uh, which I think <laughs> is we the best sad. character that I have played. I had so much fun. I'm very sad to say goodbye to Henry the Fourth. Mm. I've really enjoyed playing him over the past few plays, and he's been a really cool character. So thank you for letting me do that. <laughs> you've done absolutely amazing. Our absolutely favorite Henry. Thank you. Yes. I don't think I could thank thank ask. I don't think I could ask for a better King Henry. No. My brain is made of mush right now. That's <laughs> alright. Right. We've read a lot of Shakespeare. It kind yeah. of read a lot of Shakespeare. Mush. It's half ten. I've been reading Shakespeare for four hours now. We're Hell good. Yeah. It's fine. Um next up is me. I'm Atlas and I played York, Baggett, and the narrator for this play. And it was very fun and like a completely cold read. I have never read this play. I've never seen it before. Wild. So much fun, though, you guys. Uh, you, you did, did so amazing. well. You did uh, amazingly. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, you guys did incredible, too. Yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, we're going to head on a tail end. 
Hi. Yes, hold on. I'm, I'm actually making a list of all of the characters I've played because I forgot. Uh, <laughs> it's so... In. We have it. I played seven characters. <laughs> yes, you um, did. Yes. I did. And they were all great. So, yes. yes. Thank you. Um, so I played Gaunt, good old Bolingbroke's dad, who unfortunately died very early on in the day. Uh, I also played Carlisle, Henry Percy, who I happened to also kill a, a little while ago when I was doing Henry Prince Hal. So that was weird. Uh, I also played Bushy, <laughs> the Welsh captain who had a Scottish accent, because I can't do a Welsh one, uh, the He's second done. herald, and the keeper who got his ass kicked. Yes. So I don't have anything to plug. Just follow Crookspear and like turn yes. notifications on and stick around because we've got yeah. exciting things planned, both official yeah. and this. <laughs> yeah, this. this. Uh, all right, next up is Frey. Hey, I'm Frey. I'm new to Crookspear. This was my first show with y'all. Yeah. Was- Woo! You did so Woo! great. You yeah. did excellent. You did so Very well. brave of you to pick your first show as a Thunderdome. Yeah. Very brave. I played Northumberland, the Duchess of Gloucester, and Lord Berkeley. Um, I will link Twitter in chat, but besides that, it's been a great time. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah, it's been great to have you. It's been awesome. Um, Alright, so next up is Mr. Boson himself. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so this is like one of my favorite Shakespeare plays. It was so much fun to do with everyone. We did it. It was just amazing. Everyone did so good, and it was so much fun. Um, I played, let's see, Mowbray, who just has a massive argument with our boy uh, Bolingbroke at the start. And then just a few other random fellows, Gardener with his extended metaphor. Uh, yes, angry the so Gardener is amazing. Gardener was the best. Yeah, so the Gardener. Well. Yeah, just... now, that, now that I think about it, isn't Mowbray like one of the only characters who actually survived the play because he's just exiled and never seen again? <laughs> oh, yeah. Probably. Yeah. Uh, he just hacked off, off yeah. somewhere. Oh, <laughs> lucky bastard. <laughs> well, he, I love how you go I love how you go from playing the character that kills everyone in the play to being one of the only people that survives. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and last time I was what the only job. character who survived and now I'm like very dead. Yeah. Exceedingly. Very dead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So next up was Nicola, who unfortunately had to leave. Um, but we love Nicola. We do, we do we love do. Nicola. Yeah. We love, yeah. we love the queen. The queen. Of course. Extremely. Yes. The queen and the lady. Um, of course. Yes. Nicola, of course. Nicola yeah. does have a message for us. Uh, oh. That the queen died from sadness lot not long after her husband was replaced by an alternative reality transgender version. Just a bit of lore. <laughs> well, now we know. Now we know what happened. Now we know what happened. <laughs> the true sequel, really. Okay, so next up is Akane. Hi, I'm Akane. Um, I'm sick. No. Sorry, but I needed to be in this anyway because uh, I love Crookspear and I love you guys and Aww. I could not pass up the opportunity to uh, do the Scroop voice probably one last time. Wait, no, he's in Henry V as well. He's in Henry V. Yeah, he okay, there cool. is a Scroop. Okay, there will We're be more Scroop, unfortunately. Uh, please oh, excuse you. For more Very scroop. fortunate. Um, I also got to play the slightly more dramatic. Uh, Green member of the exclusive I got Busby and Green crew. Yeah, hell yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. The, the extremely satisfying Duchess of York. Yes. Uh, yes. This is such a good so time good. and uh, very, very fun to discover a new historical play that I hadn't heard before and subsequently loved. Exactly. Uh, I promise my voice won't sound like this the next play. You did so <laughs> um, well. Honestly, you did amazing. amazing. Thank you. Uh, Considering that you're sick, you did amazing. Yeah. Yes. And um, for once, I do have a plug. Um, <gasps> oh. So I, uh, as some people in this call know, I uh, unwisely made a Twitter bot that oh, yes. um, <laughs> generates random jellical cat names. Yes. Uh, yes. Using yes. machine learning. 
Um, it, it's it's a mess, but it also uses uh, it's slightly trained on uh, Shakespeare invented words or alleged Shakespeare invented words anyway. So uh, there's a bit of an extra treat for anyone who. Uh, well, if you're listening to this, you're probably already a Shakespeare nerd like we are. Yeah. Um, oh, that yeah. account is over at, at JellicleBot on Twitter. Uh, if you are interested, pre-use it at your own risk. Anyway, <laughs> thank you so much. That's very good. Uh, I, I would love like, all of you. I would like Highly... to take issue with the concept that we are Shakespeare nerds. That is an insult. None of us here are nerds. Yeah, God no. Who Fair even enough. likes Shakespeare here? Right. What? Oh, Sh I'm sorry. Never heard of Shakespeare. I don't think any of us like him. No, I throw down like my him. gauge at that comment. <laughs> 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 I throw down my gauge. We're all throwing the gauge. Has been thrown. Throwing I the, gauge. the gauge has been thrown. Yeah. Okay. So next up, we have Ellie. Yeah, I'm Ellie. Uh, I was the voice of the Duke of Ormel. Um, the Lady Marshal, Lord Marshal, kind of gender bent there, the Earl of Salisbury, and Lord Willoughby. And when Nicola had to leave, I picked up the rest of the Queen's, um, the Queen's voice. So, Hell yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Right. Thank you. Second and time I've been here, it's cool. Oh, sorry, on. I haven't got anything to plug. Yeah, and, oh yeah, right. like, I messed up a couple of times, sorry. No. Nah. Extremely uh, fine. I it's not a fun bit extremely no, short notice. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. We, we yeah, literally, you literally showed up. We were up. just like, hey, does anyone want to like join the Thunderdome? And then you yeah. were like, I'll be home at seven. Can you postpone until seven? And then we could because we didn't yeah. do anything for an hour. Yeah. Because we're the Thunderdome. <laughs> yeah, really... We are Last the Thunderdome. Thing, though, let's hear it for Ray. Absolutely. Yeah, let's hear it yeah. for Ray. Ray. As always. That's some great art. Ray, Ray thank you so much to support all of our yes, nonsense, thanks. and we are ever thankful for them. Yes. So yeah. thank you again, Ray, for doing for this. For everything. Yeah, for everything. Truly for, the for everything. Artwork. Yeah. And I think that's it. That's it. Yeah. I do uh, just want to. I do just want to say one thing. Caterpillars of the Commonwealth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> looking forward to it so there we go <laughs> excellent right. um, so we are going to raid um pizza suplex aka patrick gill in just a second now so if you guys stick around uh please do and say hello raid time raid time raid time raid time I don't think we have time for a sap session. I honestly feel like I'm just about to pass out. <laughs> I feel like I have had my sap session just, you know, through the play. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, we have now raided. We have raided.